Okay. Welcome to the October 27th, 2021 Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. Um, first agenda item is comments from the chair, me. Um, my only comments are that while our agenda looks short, we have three hearings. They're all pretty complicated projects um, with a lot of interested parties. Um, so we're gonna have to, if you guys can help me stay on task, I'm gonna, as we open the hearing, set up some pretty clear guidelines on like time allotments and topics and how we behave discourse um, during the meeting. So um, yeah, so I appreciate everyone's support sticking to that, kind of um, walking the line between uh, making sure everyone feels like they're included and heard and has the information they need, but then also um, maintaining forward momentum. Yeah, Anna. Leroy is in the attendees list. Oh, oh getting them right now. Sorry, thank you. No problem. Um, do we have him? I, I just appointed him. He should be popping in. Okay. I've got to check and see there what's going on with, with that. Um, so yeah. Hi, Leroy. Hi. Sorry. I was just saying we have a, what seems like a short agenda with three hearings, but they're pretty dense hearings with lots of interested parties. So as we open the hearings, I'm gonna set some pretty clear guidelines about kind of a timeline and time limit for each part of each hearing and each hearing. Um, and so I was just saying, I appreciate everyone's help kind of finding that balance between making sure that everyone involved is included, heard, has the information they need, um, but then also keeping forward momentum um, and efficiency and a kind of avoiding redundancy and moving off topic too far. Um, so help me keep track of who needs to talk when and, and let's uh, stay on, this, on the schedule as much as possible. Um, I appreciate that. Cause as you guys know, I'm bad at Zoom. So <laughs> any help is good help. Um, but that's all I had to say on that. Uh, so director's report, Dave, hi Dave. Did you have anything to share? Hi, good evening. I actually don't, I, I know I wanna, um, support Anna during her discussion of the CPA proposal. So I would, I would uh, defer to to Erin if if she has significant updates for the commission. I, I'm happy to take some time if you have it later, but I would uh, give my time over to Erin. Okay, thanks, Dave. Yeah, Erin. Yeah, I mean, I, I envision that we move right into um, the open space or uh, land use application and the um, CPA updates and whichever we do first is really um, kind of at your discretion. I see Meg Gage in the panelists. So if we want to start with CPA, um, that would be completely fine with me. Okay. Okay, um, then... Meg, I'm going to promote you to a panelist so you can join us. Um, let's see if she comes in. All right. So this is a CPA. CPA. On mute. Right. All right. So, how are we structuring this? Anna, I know you're our liaison to the CPA. Do you want to kind of run this talk, run this so section? I guess I'll, I'll defer to Meg. So Meg, I put together a little uh, quick presentation with the three proposals that apply to CONCOM. Um, so if you think it'd be helpful for us to have an overview first and then you go, I'm happy to do that. But if you are ready to go now and want to start with yours and then let me uh, why don't you do? Why don't you do the overview so people have a context? And I'm curious to see what the other two are. Ours is quite straightforward, and I know how busy you're. I just heard uh, what Jen said about the meeting. So ours, will, why don't you give the overview, and then maybe what I have to say will be briefer because of what you said. Beautiful. Okay. Um, so second question, Aaron, I had sent you some slides. Do you want to drive, or do you want me to drive? Well, I don't. Um, well, it's it's entirely up to you if you prefer. Um, but I can also. I've got it queued up, so I can. I love I would love you to so that I can look at my notes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. 
All right. So um, just while she, oh, you're so fast. Okay. So there are three um, proposals that are particularly relevant to Conservation Commission, um, the Mill River Historic Trail, General Trail Improvements, and then Hickory Ridge Trail Improvements. So you can keep going. So just to give you a quick picture, um, one of the things that is interesting about CPA this year is uh, that is different from last year is we have more projects than funding. So we will have to be making some choices this year, which we did not have to do um, last year. We got we got lucky, um, or I don't know if I'd call it lucky, but that was the situation last year. So the first one, the applicant for the Mill River Historic Trail, Meg Gage is with us representing the District One Neighborhood Association. And they are applying for an amount of $12,900. The trail improvements and Hickory Ridge are both coming from town of Amherst. Dave can speak to those as well once I finish the <laughs> overview of this. Um, the trail improvements is, is for 50,000. The Hickory Ridge application is for 150,000. Next one. So just a quick overview um, here. You, yeah, thanks. So I know this is a lot of text. All of my presentation design instincts are screaming at me, but uh, bear with me. So the overview of the, the Mill River um, historic walking trail, this is really, you know, they, they came before us last year and I guess speaking personally for myself, it's a really exciting project. Um, and so we, uh, I'm glad it was not accepted last year under the kind of qualifications of CPA, which are very specific. And so I was really excited to see them come back this year and, and, um, uh, frame it and, and change the project enough to fit those CPA guidelines. So the overview is that they're trying to conduct research on the um, historic infrastructure and historic sites along the Mill River, the history and the present conditions. This is something where you know historic artifacts have been found. We know that that some of these historic sites exist, but they've never been preserved um, or recorded at, on site necessarily. So they are applying for funding to um, conduct that research. There are four sites along the Mill River, um, and the project includes the the river and the like the bank area right so the the reason why we are included is obviously it's the mill river um as well as it's on the entire project is on conservation land the things i want to pull your attention to are actually more of the implications for phase two of this project um which is actions to preserve the site so wanting to make sure that we are very clear on the conservation implications and the needs um, as we think about uh, preservation there, as well as signage um, that they are hoping to create along the trail. So again, we wanna just make sure, we've talked about signage a lot, but we haven't necessarily had the time to sit down and come up with a comprehensive plan. And so I think we wanna make sure that we are being very clear in, um, in what we need for, what our expectations are for signage and, and um, not disturbing the environment with it. So that's my lightning fast overview of the first project. Um, quick questions now, knowing that Meg is here ready to answer your questions better than I can after I'm done. Okay, next one, Erin. So, oh, sorry, I have pictures. I took your pictures, Meg. Um, so <laughs> these are some of the pictures. I'm, I'm gonna just rush through these because Meg, we can pull this back up and you can explain what these are better than I can. Okay. But these are, unless you want to now, if you wanna, no, I think showing them, I know how busy you are, but the one, these are uh, examples of dams and the structure on the um, right side isn't there anymore, but we hope to describe what it was. Yep. So keep and going, I, Anna, you're doing an awesome job. I'm, not gonna I'm trying to, to talk very fast. I, I looked at this agenda and like got my cup of tea ready. So um, next one, Aaron. So this is the next ones are, the next pictures are the current status of the, the sites. And so you can see where, you know, some of this historic, um, these historic sites are quite literally crumbling. And so, you know, thinking about trying to balance that historic preservation and recognition with conservation um, as we think about these sites going forward. I think there might be one more. Oh, nope. So then it's okay, you can keep, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blaze right through. People know they can interrupt me, I hope. Um, Town of Amherst trail improvements. This is something that we've seen um, in other contexts, but this is this request is specifically going to, to CPA. Um, there, the trail saw increased use during the pandemic. The, um, the scope of this, you can see what they're trying to purchase, right? Materials and equipment rental to improve the trails. It's pretty, this one's pretty cut and dry, um, as well as replacing bog bridges uh, to, to make sure that we're protecting the wetlands that bridging needs to go over. And again, similar why we are involved, all of these are on conservation land um, because it's to improve trails on conservation land. 
So uh, really it's just that we've seen more wear and tear. Uh, these trails need, need uh, improved maintenance as well as some ADA uh, improvements when required. And then we got no pictures on this one, I don't think. So next one, last one, big one, Hickory Ridge. So we know Hickory Ridge is a big undertaking the town is, is going for. We're able to use, as a reminder, you can't use CPA funds on conservation projects that were not purchased um, with CPA funds. And so Hickory Ridge, because uh, we, we were able to uh, support that with CPA funding, we're able to use CPA funding to maintain it. So this is, to construct new walking trails as well as improve the existing cart paths and make those into accessible trails. Um, uh, this also includes the existing bridges. I don't know if anyone else was able to get out there for the, um, the tour sessions with Dave, but some of the bridges, uh, they, you know, they put up the snow fencing just to make sure nobody fell in. The, the bridges need some, some support there. And really, you know, this is one of the things that is amazing about Hickory Ridge is that it's gonna provide access to conservation land to a few different apartment complexes that have not had easily accessible land before. And so part of this is creating trails that, um, that folks can access Hickory from a couple different points. The other part, which we're getting back to signs again, is um, kiosks and benches. So the benches are for rela relaxation. The kiosks might include maps, rules, and environmental education. So, you know, something to consider, um, you know, this is a town project. So obviously Dave already knows what we're dealing with in terms of signs, but it's worth considering kind of what we what we want to see in terms of kiosks there. And then, you know, our implications, not only will part of Hickory be conserved, but also maintenance will be um, will be a consideration because that's something that um, Brad and Brandon, I'm so used to saying Brad and Tyler that it's so hard to, to switch over, uh, will have to, um, conservation staff will have to maintain. And so we want to make sure we're setting them, setting them up for success in whatever trails go in there. Um, trails will be crushed stone dust, permeable, solid, uh, as well, and that means that they're walkable, but they're also rollable for, for wheelchair access. Um, this also funding will be used for geotextile fabric and um, gravel borrow and crushed, crushed stone for the top course. So the edges of the trail will be, will be grassy, and we I do have pictures in this one, and this is also, I believe, in your packet. Um, if you didn't get a chance to check it out. So I know this is tiny, but this is the overall map with the um, the proposed trails. So you can kind of see how those link up to the different apartment buildings. And then you can also see the solar sites on there that we permitted a while back. I can't remember when that was, but a while back. And next, so these are, I included Dave's captions, but this, these are where trails will go that are current fairways. So they're not, um, there is no existing cart path and uh, a pr the proposed trails run through areas like this where it's grassy. You can go to the next one, Erin. And then you can see what the existing cart trails look like. It is pretty amazing how quickly uh, nature's reclaimed Hickory Ridge. And so it's, it's pretty amazing, I, I, pretty incredible to watch that happen. Um, but that includes the cart paths and we wanna keep those as trail um, as, as much as possible. So we wanna try to improve the condition there. And then you can see the Fort River, you know, so much of this work is in service of um, restoring the quality of the Fort River. Um, and you can see the bridge there, which will need a little bit of a little bit of attention as well. I think that's yeah. So what I'm hoping you will do is ask me lots of questions, but we have not started the hearings for these projects yet. So um, if you have questions that you want me to bring forward to the, to the town of Amherst, um, Meg is here, so you can ask your questions right now. But if something comes up, know that I will have another chance to, to be hearing from the folks proposing these projects. Um, and then, you know, if we support them or not, we can, we can kind of voice that support uh, in, I will voice that support on our behalf in those hearings should, or lack thereof, um, should we be interested. That middle step, invite groups to present. We have both groups here, so we are lucky to be able to hear from both of them um, tonight and in the future if we would like to. So I think that's that wraps it up for me. Any questions for me before we turn it over to Meg? I have, I have one question. What What is the amount of funding that's available? It's a really good question, Larry, and I should have looked it up right beforehand, and I will pull that up for you and have it by the end of Meg's talk. Because I, as soon as I said that, I was like, I should be able to I should have been prepared with that amount, unless Dave knows it off the top of his head, but I'll get it for you. Next question. It's a, it's, I think it's about 1.5 million, but you, right. and Anna, just definitely look it up. 
Yeah, I will. Uh, Michelle. I was just wondering what um, the priority levels were for the maintenance of the existing trails, like specifically throughout Amherst, just before um, funding any new projects, just like what, what is actually high priority for fixing bog bridges and maybe wetlands at risk. And, and maybe that's something you have to come back with, but that would be helpful in making a decision, I think. It's a really good question. I'm gonna see if Dave has an answer to that now. If not, I will give him a week and then I will ask. I will get back to you. Yeah, no, I, I think I can answer that right now. Um, but I don't, it's not a data-based answer. What I can say is this, is that um, in reality, there are no capital, virtually no capital funds to maintain trails in the town of Amherst. So we have an operating budget every year that funds two staff members, two FTEs to work on trails, but there's no capital money, virtually no capital money to go with that. We for years have kind of beg, pleaded, and borrowed from different sources to try to find money to replace bridges, to do ADA trails, um, and predating me working for the town, Pete Westover, who was the conservation director uh, for 30 years, you know, did private fundraising, go for grants, et cetera, et cetera. So right now, as an example, we're, we're trying to finish up as much of the Robert Frost Trail uh, as we possibly can. We got about a $30,000 grant for the Robert Frost Trail through the uh, DCR uh, Rec Trails program. Um, so the bottom line is there's way more need, there's way more demand out there than even $50,000 will fund. Um, Aaron and I are working on a couple of bridge replacements and I will be honest, one of those bridges might be $35,000. So $50,000 seems like a lot, but it's really not. And then the related question is, do we fix what we have or, 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 or start something new? And I wish there was a clear cut answer to that the bottom line is, if we buy it, they will come. So if we proceed with Hickory Ridge, which I think is the full intention of the town, we've got to be ready to do something at least minimally out there to make it accessible and inviting and safe for people to use it. They're already using it now and we don't even own it. So hundreds of people are using it monthly, uh, even though Barry Roberts still owns it. So what we've done is twofold. We've applied for community development block grant funding. And I think I mentioned this at the last meeting, but I think uh, the number was $180,000 to create a core trail north south at Hickory Ridge. And we see this $150,000 as a supplement to that to uh, create branches on that core tree, the, that core trail um, to enhance some of the, the uh, existing cart paths that are already there. So I hope that kind of answers it, but there's, there's need in both places. And I wish we could, I wish we could buy Hickory Ridge, uh, tell everyone to pause and not use it for a year or two until we, we get a, a master plan done. But the reality is we've got to hit the ground running and get some of those, at least the basics done. Uh, directional trails and some of the, the connecting trails done as soon as possible. So there's there's need out there um, greater than than uh, what we've put on uh, on CPA. Um, I hope that helps, Michelle. Larry, to answer your question, it's a little under 1.4 million that we have available for us this year, and we have uh, four uh, just over four million in applications and debt service. That we're paying. So that's that's the whole state, I assume. No, what? No, no, that's just Amherst. Just that's just Amherst. Okay. Is it is it possible with some of these that are here now to to write them as phased? So it's phase one of the golf course or phase one of the of the the town trails mm -hmm. and set it up that way so that it can be hit in multiple years. Um, I think I'm going to look to Dave to correct me on this. I think you, typically when projects uh, are are submitted that are significant. So last year we had an application for the for the Jones Library um, special collection, right? And that was we bonded it, and so we're still paying debt service on those projects. And actually, I'll look to Fletcher too to to correct me on this too. But 
I'm not sh my question though would be I don't know if the projects need to apply um in that with that uh assumption or not um we can always ask that question but i it's not i think with these particular these projects they're not necessarily big enough that we would phase them um and i don't know if they are possible to be phased that would be a question for dave no that's a good question larry just to follow up on what anna said so i'm staring at the proposals on my desktop there are 18 total which is a lot as anna indicated and there's way there, there's far more asks than there there is money. It's typically the purview of the CPAC to, um, if they if they so choose, they can um, they can reduce the amount of the award. Essentially, they can say, well, you've asked for 150. What about you know? They could say the same thing you did, Larry. Oh, you know. We'd be willing to entertain seventy-five thousand dollars and come back to us next year um, for the rest, or something like that. Um, again, for a proposal as small as modest, I would say, as Meg's and oh, I, then the North Amherst folks, I would say, you know, uh, let's. Uh, my hope is they would support that. And well, and last uh, year, this ours is now step one of what we proposed last year, which was yeah. for one hundred and sixty thousand for this wonderful community project that was too much and we kind of talked past the sale yeah. and now we're just proposing step one which is exactly what larry said is what we're doing for twelve thousand nine hundred. but i'm just agreeing with you it's the cpa has really uh you could say arcane or specific or narrow or uh things they can you know very prescribed that's a neutral word it, it, yeah, it is very prescribed. And, like, and so the proposal was too much. So what we're now looking for, I don't want to change the subject from general discussion of conservation projects, but that's exactly what Larry proposed is what we did. Yeah. But Larry, I ask, is, sorry. sorry. No, I was just gonna say I will I will ask that question of the Hickory Ridge um uh Hickory Ridge proposal. I think that, you know, it's one of the things that's helpful. To think about is what needs to be done all at once versus kind of what can feasibly be phased in and and to dave's point people aren't going to stop using the using the resource right and so is it better to spend that money now so we have the trails versus people making their own trails which is not what we want so right i mean there's consideration to to both of those jen did you have a question well yeah or just maybe a point of clarification the other thing is that CPA can't commit future dollars. So like when you said phased, Larry, I was also, it made me think like, oh, could you say, okay, I'm proposing a three-year project and it's mm -hmm. X amount of money, $50,000 over three years, but that's not how CPA mm -hmm. works, correct? Like they can only commit money for the coming year. It's very for, the most, for the most part, that's true, Jen. In Amherst and many other towns, when you bond something, you are actually making a multi-year commitment. So okay. when we when we bond a, a open space acquisition or we bond an affordable housing project over ten years, sometimes you're making a ten-year commitment. So you you can only really say we're going to give you you know if it's a five hundred thousand dollar bond, we'll give you a hundred thousand dollars this year, but we're going to cover the four hundred thousand dollars in year two, three, four, or five, and okay. then and then the interest. But yeah, they typically would not, they do not say, hey, um, 150,000 for trails will give you half this year and half next year. They typically would no. not do that. Okay. They only bond, the commitment is for bonding over multiple years. Okay, thanks. And the, yeah. the other thing I just wanted to say about trails, and, and I've been thinking about this as I sit in this chair longer is, um, <laughs> is, um, <laughs> I'd love to have, I mean, I'd love to be able to say that Amherst has the best trails in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the, the most accessible miles of trails, um, the better, most well-maintained trails and bridges and bog bridges and all of that. I would be lying to you if I said that's where we are. We're not there. And I can't tell you how many times people have said, you know, they talk to me about where they've been hiking and they say, oh, the Conti, the Conti Trail in Hadley. And, you know, sometimes I get a little defensive, I guess is the right word, because I go, wow, 
you know, why does everybody love that trail? And part of the reason is it's easy to use, it's accessible, it's granted, it's all it's all pressure treated and 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 whatnot. I don't think we're going to get there, but I'd like us to be. I'd like to be um, more proud of of the condition of our trail, the condition of our bridges. I'd like consistent parking. I'd like consistent kiosk signage um, and uh, and branding that people, when you get to an Amherst trail, you know that's what it is. And and unfortunately, we're not there yet. But I do think we need some funding to get there. Mm -hmm. I think you should look at it not as a failing, Dave, but as a huge potential. I mean, the yeah. land. Oh, yeah. No, 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 we're not, we're not yeah. failing. People <laughs> I mean, love we, our trails. I, no, but to, the, to your uh, point, like, you know, the amount of conservation land that we have is amazing. It's just that our marketing is, is lagging, hmm. like, the preservation of the land, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And if you, if you live here, you probably can find it. And but if you're not from here, you're just visiting for the weekend or a week or or your family or whatever, um, you know, are the maps well, well, well uh, publicized and, and, and up to date? Are the are the kiosks, is everything uh, um, um, blazed well? All of those things. I think we need to step up our game. Um, so, oh, sorry. I really, I had full intentions of keeping myself to 10 minutes and then I, I forgot about the questions part, but sorry, Jen. Um, Am I allowed to, Aaron? Am I allowed to say if folks have other questions they want me to ask the applicants that they can email those to me? Is that permissible? Um, you, yeah. So email them to you, and you can. You tell can me. If it's from board members, concom members, if you email me, I'll consolidate them, That's and then perfect. we can go through me so that it's not right. any that would be great violation. Yeah. Thank you. I was I was trying to remember my packet in my head. So yeah. Um, any other questions? Uh, email them to Aaron, and then we'll have we have Meg here now. Um, I will, I have to consult my CPA agenda just to confirm when each hearing is, but they're the next few weeks. Um, so get those questions to Aaron, hopefully soon. The, um, proposals are in your packet in the SharePoint file Great. and Meg take it. Okay. I'll be really brief. Cause Anna, you did such an awesome job Sorry. of describing Sorry. our project yeah. and Dave, I just want to say, I love that you sit in that chair <laughs> and also to appreciate Aaron's leadership over and over in all so many ways. So thank you, Aaron. Um, I don't need to say too much. Last year we applied for $160,000 for a really spectacular big project that would involve the community and make this conservation area a magnet for people who wanna come and learn about our history. North Amherst along the Mill River was an industrial center of Western Massachusetts through much of the 19th century. In fact, in 1775, when the revolution started, there were already six mills on the Mill River in North Amherst. And we see our project is a conservation project, basically. It's a miracle that it's all on conservation land and so that it's protected. Many of the sites actually were on the Summer Street side of Mill River and they've all been totally demolished, but there are a number that are uh, right along the river, right along the trail. I mean, you don't even have to make a new trail to get to them. Uh, and we we know that people are out treasure hunting, digging down for Civil War coins and buttons. And we have a picture, I didn't have it here, but um, we our hope is to conserve what's left of these sites and with minimal signage, everybody's really worried about signage. So I wanna say something about that in a minute. Uh, we would help people who walk along the trail to be able to understand the history. And thanks to QR codes, people can, you know, get their phone and boom, boom, be have access to a website and photographs and uh, extensive information that you wouldn't want to put on a sign. So just to be clear, whatever signage there is will be determined through a process that we all participate in. We don't want to disrupt the, uh, the natural beauty. There's already, I know, because um, I don't have an opinion on it, but I know there's different opinions about the story trail, storybook thing. Um, they have 18 signs. I doubt we'll have 18 signs all the way to Cushman, but uh, there are some places where you'd want a sign to say there was a, at Puffer's Pond, for example, the, um, the ice business was a really big deal, harvesting ice in the winter and saving it so people would have ice. But this was before electricity uh, during the summer. And um, the Clam Club, which is right off the trail, and there's still a midden of clamshells, which was a men's club, a drinking club, um, just 
just a little bit west of Cushman Common. Uh, and, and it's a history that's really can be uh, illuminated uh, with just a, with, with very, very little uh, intrusion into the conservation elements of the, of the trail. Um, we have a committee we're forming that'll do, that'll monitor. So I think there'll actually be more surveillance and protection than there, there is now people. We have a committee identified of about 15 people in the district who will sort of take responsibility for making sure that people aren't treasure hunting and, and demolishing the stones. I mean, it's people innocently take these stones apart. Uh, for example, last summer when the beach was limited because of COVID, some people would go upstream and take stones from wherever they could find them and make dams in order to create deeper water. And, uh, you know, it's not intentional piracy, but it's, it's slowly destroying some of these historic treasures. I mean, really, it was quite the industrial center until things moved to Holyoke with the greater Connecticut River that had so much more potential. And most people don't know about it. When I actually got first interested in this when I was teaching history at Amherst High School decades ago, many, many like in the 70s, and I, my students had to write research papers and I would get these cool papers about the hat factory on Summer Street or the paper mill. And because uh, there's a, a lot of information, but it's gotta be pulled together. Someone said that a lot of stuff is in Pete Westover's basement. So I called him and he said, yeah, there's some boxes. I've got a lot of notes and uh, there's research that's been done. I don't know if I can find it. Well, we need to get those boxes and put them in the historical, read through them and put them in the historical society. So I, I could go on and on because I'm so excited about this project, but I'll stop and just say in one sentence, the scope of this particular proposal for $12,900 is only to hire to work with an archaeology team, wonderful team that we've been working with, UMass, we're so lucky to be next door to UMass, it has all this amazing talent, that will do the preliminary research on four sites, the canal and the, uh, in the Mill River and the dam at the recreation area, the clam club and the two Roberts Mills that have the most significant um, foundations left. And then we'll go from there. Thank you. And I will Really would like a, because... No, you're, <laughs> I, could... yeah, I want a shirt that's the clam club on it because that's amazing. The clam um, club is, was a men's club except for wedding receptions. For the, I think oh, back nice. then they were heterosexual weddings. <laughs> um, all right. So any questions for Meg now or if you come up with them again, please email them to Erin and uh, she can compile them. Okay. Um, well, we're going to keep going, Meg. Much appreciated. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you Bye. There. I'm going to hang in because I'm interested in the rest of the agenda, So, but I'll be in the background. <laughs> okay. Bye. We'll, we'll boot you. I think Jen will boot you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for doing that, um, and good luck with the coming meetings. Um, all right. So... It's 7.35 I have, so we can start our first hearing, which is TRC for ASD Shootsbury um, MA Solar LLC for the construction of a solar photovoltaic energy generation facility and access road and buffer zone to BBW at Shootsbury Road. And I believe, let's see. Uh, Maria, right, Erin? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm gonna promote you to a panelist. Was there anyone else, do you think? Or I guess I'll wait for Maria to join. Oh, I have another hand up. So this is, we're just looking for people who are presenters right now for the applicant. Yep. Oh, um, I put the public, wrong Maria, hold on. Public comment. Um, public comment, I think we'll probably be doing a, in a little while, so. Um, yep. Yeah. So if you're um, a member of the public joining uh, for public comment, give us a second. Um, Maria, are you there? I am here. And, okay. Uh, and Welcome. Is also presenting. If you could, he should have raised his hand. Who is? Sorry, Andrew. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
we should have Andrew. Okay, um, so first, before we kick off this um, hearing, I'm gonna create some structure for timing for these hearings tonight, um, just because we have very dense um, hearings and we're gonna have a lot of people to hear from. So in order for everyone to be able to participate, we're gonna do a five minute presentation by the applicant, five minute comment from staff, five minute Q&A from commission. Um, and then, I mean, we would love to keep public comment to, 10 minutes, but what we'll do is for now is say two minutes per member of the public. And I would just ask if we're, we're say we're glad you're here, we're glad you're engaging with us on this. Um, we're looking forward to hearing what people have to say, but I will also say that our job is to protect the water resources and the wetlands in Amherst. So please keep your comments and input germane to like what we have the ability to do here. Um, so while I know that um, a solar array at the, on this property could have impacts um, in a lot of far-reaching ways in the ecosystem. I 100% appreciate that. I 100% appreciate far-reaching implications, good and bad, of this kind of development. Um, but what we can do here is protect the water resource and wetlands involved. Um, so, so please um, help me focus our conversation on things that this board is kind of um, in charge of. <laughs> So, and then the last thing I'll say is just that um, we really need to maintain a healthy, respectful discourse here. And if people are going off the rails and I feel like we're not um, having a productive conversation, listening to each other and being respectful of everyone's opinions, I will ask you to stop talking and I will mute you if I have to. Um, so please be respectful. The fact that there's a lot of varied interests um, for use on these lands um, and in, in protecting our water resources and be respectful of other people in the meeting. Um, so with that, uh, Maria, Andrew, welcome. Um, as you heard, we're gonna give you about five minutes to give an overview of the project. I understand that we're still waiting on responses to comments from Aaron or questions from Aaron and um, questions from the DEP. So I think in the long run, we'll be continuing this hearing again, um, but maybe you could give us an, a brief overview now. Uh, do you want to get us Andrew? started? Sure, great. Thanks everybody for your time. I appreciate it. I will try to be very brief. Um, I know everyone's time is very valuable. <laughs> um, my name is Andrew Chabot. I am a senior manager at AMP Energy, uh, leading our Massachusetts projects. And uh, AMP Energy is a solar developer seeking to develop solar and often coupled with energy storage projects on their projects. Um, today, I'm joined by Maria Furstenberg from TRC, the engineering firm uh, working with us to make sure that we're uh, complying and leading all the environmental efforts on site. Uh, this project in particular is located off Shootsbury Road. Uh, it's across three parcels that comprise about 100 acres or so. Uh, for which the disturbed acreage for the project would be about 45 acres, uh, give or take. And uh, the system size is roughly expected to be about um, 11 megawatts DC, as it's currently planned, as proposed. Uh, but with that, uh, TRC has done uh, a lot of work assessing the environmental footprint uh, and impact here. So I will uh, couch it there and I will turn it over to Maria to get into the nitty gritty. So thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so we have been involved with this for a while. We've actually been in front of you before for an ANRAD for this site. Um, so all of the resources present at the site um, have already been reviewed um, and the limits have been um, agreed to. So this project is, is really looking at the design of the project at this point. Um, we are very sure about where everything actually is. With respect to the questions that we received from Aaron, we were under the impression that we'd be able to go through those with you tonight. Um, we also received DEP's comments earlier today. Um, 
So, with yes, I, if I could just address that. So those initial um, questions, I was sort of hoping to get just written responses from those so that I could prepare a report with recommendations to the board. But um, I mean, do you wanna like show a, a plan of the property or a map of the property or anything like that just as a part of like sort of the initial um, introduction? That would be really helpful just for my own purposes. I read through all the documentation, but any sort of map you have site plan would be extremely helpful. Just an overview, really? Yeah. Maria, I might be able to pull something up if you, unless I, you have something. I have something. I'm just okay. finding the right screen. Can everyone see that? Yes. Yeah, we see. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is the overall site plan. There's an access proposed off of Shutesbury Road. This is actually an existing access onto this property that we are proposing to use and extend as needed um, to about here for this project. As you can see, we have avoided wetlands in our placement. And in most places, we have only used a limited amount of the buffer zone um, because of shading. So do you have specific questions about the site layout at all? We so um, thank you for that. I think that really here, you know, Erin has taken a first look at this and in order to kind of issue her full report or a full review of the project, she needs answers to several detailed questions, which I know she emailed um, to you. So I guess, Erin, um, do you want to say anything further as part of your report? Um, I would, I would sort of yield for public comment at this point. I, what I would like to do is get the responses from TRC to my questions, the responses to the DEP comments. And then if there are any pertinent comments that come up tonight that they're, they, my understanding is their intention was to sort of collect all questions and then issue a written response that was holistic and addressed all questions. And then once I have a chance to have a look at that, then I'll, I feel like I'll be more prepared um, to have a, a report as far as um, how the project complies with the regs from my perspective. Yep. And commissioners, um, Maria, would you mind if stop, to stop sharing your screen? Can I actually just ask one question, Jen, before she does? Where's the point oh, yeah. of interconnect? Where's the interconnection point here? Is it, where is it, Maria? Um, Andrew, would you mind answering that? I, I believe that it comes in along the access road, but that is correct. It, it does okay. come in along the access road. I see. Yes. Okay. Commissioners, any other clarifying questions here um, while we have the, the drawing up? I have a question for Aaron, which is um, I didn't see the DEP comments in our file. Do you have those and are we able to see them? Yeah, they just came in um, about 11 o'clock today. So um, that's why they haven't been shared yet. No worries. Site visits this afternoon. Yeah, and I guess I should zoom out on that a point of clarification there. For all of the hearings tonight, materials came in literally today during business hours, um, partially during business hours and then after Aaron's working day. So um, unfortunately, if we don't have materials 48 hours before the meeting, it's impossible for us to do a, like a full thorough technical review, not to mention even getting it to the commissioners um, in order for us to see it. So yeah, so that is not Aaron's fault. Uh, we need a little bit more time with these materials to work through it, as I know you know, Anna. <laughs> 
I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. That's all. Yeah, just, of course. Thank you for yep. clarifying. Yep. Okay. Um, and also commissioners, I'll put you to the packet. Um, there's a long list of Aaron's clarifying questions for me. One of the big ones is understanding the stormwater modeling on that's been done on the site, um, where you just need a lot more technical information as to understanding the resulting changes to stormwater runoff to, uh, um, the resources on the site in order to, to fully review this project. Um, commissioners, any other comments or questions? I have one that was just really simple and, and I apologize if it was addressed. I did read all 369 pages of this thing. Uh, but I, Maria, I know I see you laughing. I, pro I look at every single one. I got post-its on them and everything. Um, but you know, I think my question is I'd love to see sort of the, the cost benefit analysis of why the road needs to be in the buffer. Um, and what the impact would be just to scooch it out of the buffer for y'all in terms of panels um, and what that the loss of panels would be on that. I know, it, I mean, it's like, it's it's so close. Uh, it can, yeah, you know. just, just, just so that everyone can see, we're, we're talking about this piece of the access right here. And the, the reason that it was placed there is because that's where the existing access already is. Um, you're not... You're not gaining anything really by moving the road out of there. It's it's already a clear cut area. So um, and then the next one down though, the the next little bump out where the wetlands kind of look like bite marks in the plan, um, that also goes within the uh, the buffer as well, doesn't it? Right before the, it gets the, to the access road is not within the buffer. There is a small amount of tree clearing in that area because of shading. It says proposed 15 foot compacted and vegetated maintenance access path. Is that, is that not on my map? I'm on page 81 right now, but I know it's on a couple other ones. Right next to the outlet, proposed outlet pond. Am I misreading this? No, it is, however, outside of your 75 foot no structure zone. Mm -hmm. But to Anna's point, it is proposed Anna. to be with Anna, um, sorry. Okay. Be within so yeah, so I guess I'd, I'd still love kind of the, the thoughts on what the cost would be if it were moved out of that buffer um, as well. Sorry, just give me a second to make sure I've got the questions. As, as Aaron noted, we were trying to compile everything, um, especially because there's some overlap between what Aaron asked about and what the EP asked about. So we wanted to make it easier for everyone to actually see everything. Looking for my other post-its, Jen, sorry. No, no problem. So to summarize, Anna, you would say the question is, can we get the access road out of the buffer? That is an accurate summary. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then my other thing, my other question, Maria, is on page, and again, I want to just make sure I'm reading these correctly. On page 67, um, the I feel like these are all the same map, but for some reason in my head, I was like, no, this page is the specific one I want to talk about. Uh, the clearing. Is that noting that the clearing up at the, hang on, let me zoom out, kind of a smack dab in the middle there. Um, is the clearing going right up to that 50 foot or line that? I think it's a 30 foot. 30 foot, thank you, yeah. So I'm the clearing in. Is, is in with, it, far within that buffer, is that correct? It, it is up to that line that is per your regulations, how far we're allowed to clear. Um, in in that particular area, we are clearing up to that line. Um, in a lot of other areas, we are staying further away. Yep. And that is, uh, again, dictated by shading direction. So that's why some areas have more buffer zone depth of impact than others. Yep. 
Um, and then I have an, a question, Aaron, for you. Sorry, Jen. I I only I think I only have like seven post-its. Uh, Aaron, my question is if Maria, if you don't mind going up to page 65. Aaron, what's the impact of having a, a vernal pool that's isolated right in the middle like that? What are the is that I mean? Yeah, yeah I mean, I well, vernal better. pools are um all the, the species that rely on them are migratory species so right. they can travel up to 400 feet around a vernal pool so if you um i mean I, we have a hundred foot no disturb and i believe their proposal is to stay within those bounds um but it would it would pretty much isolate the pool would the pool last in your opinion but it's like survive. I don't think it would do anything good for the pool. The Thank pool you. Or the species in the pool. Um, yeah, but so the, so they're they're meeting our hundred foot no touch for vernal pools, and there's nothing we really we can do to change the deline resource delineation at this point. Right, yeah. um, that does come back to some stormwater questions that Aaron had detailed. Um, yep. So I get, again, I would just draw your attention to the, the detailed technical questions about stormwater modeling approach and results, uh, Maria from Aaron. Yeah, yeah. And, and a couple of my questions were about connectivity, like how we could create connectivity so that there might be a passageway created in some cases, like um, right under where it says sheet 305, there's a wetland that would essentially be, um, um, it would have solar panels all around it. And so like that ice creating that isolated pocket of wetlands there, like, is there any way to um, provide some way for species to migrate in between those, those um, pockets of wetlands there? Um, yeah, that was one of my questions. So that, yeah. Thank you. That was the better way of articulating my, my question of like, what does this mean? Um, and how can right. we make, kind of lessen any impact of that being isolated? Right. Yeah. What can we do to, to help? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yep. understand, I totally understand they are within the buffer. I not disagreeing on that at all, but just again, yep. like thinking about the resource. Yeah. Great. Okay. I think that's all I had for now. So no need to apologize. Thanks, Anna. Commissioners, other questions? Um, can can I please have an opportunity to address the question? Sure. So the as has been stated, we are maintaining the full 100 foot buffer around the vernal pool areas, which was something that was discussed back when we did the ANRAD work. Um, there is, per Mass DEP's guidance, a wildlife gap around the entire facility, which allows the movement of small and mid sized animals throughout this entire area. So all of these species that are dependent on vernal pools will have full access to this area without changing anything as it's currently presented. And just to add a uh, latch on a little there as well, uh, what that looks like is it's typically a six inch gap uh, on the fence on the ground floor so that there's enough uh, egress for small animals and wildlife to be able to move around as Maria mentioned. What does the surfacing underneath the panels look like? That might be useful for the commission to know. Um, it's vegetated. So it, um, I believe it's detailed on the plans what the seed mix is, but the outside of the access drive itself and the equipment pads, everything is going to be vegetated with a wildlife seed mix. So it, it is designed to provide value for wildlife. And, and how is that vegetation controlled? Um, it's periodically mowed. There, there there's a, a maximum height where it would start to shade the panels. So it gets mowed a couple of times a year to make sure that it doesn't exceed that. So and mowing, are there chemical controls as well? No. I have more posted. And, and, oh, sorry, uh, sorry just, just one other thing to add. Yeah. Um, so we will be seeking to pursue uh, certification under UMass Amherst. Uh, so uh, PV friendly poll uh, pollinator certification. Uh, which does mandate that 
you have to use native vegetation, no chemical applications, uh, and that it does, is maintained only on a limited basis. Uh, it's typically once, maybe twice a year. And I believe the certification says you can't mow past, was it April? Uh, so that you're being, allowing uh, species time during the late spring and summer to uh, propagate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, full, fully flower so that the pollinators can take advantage of them. Thanks. So my next question is on point uh, 4.2. So this talks about this being a limited project. And, and again, this isn't this may just be me kind of clarifying language here. So I hear you saying that you can't move that road because there's an existing road there. And so you want to keep it where it is, which is within the buffer, but a limited project qualifies as that's a new access roadway. So I'm, I'm curious about how those two things are aligned. Like, is it a new access roadway or are you stuck where you are because there's an existing road? So the project was designed to essentially use an area that was already degraded. If there was not an existing degradation of the buffer zone there, then we would have stayed further away in that spot. With respect to limited projects, this was provided in the report as information just to remind everyone that the Wetlands Protection Act has provisions for encouraging renewable energy projects. Mm -hmm. Technically, you have to be impacting a resource area for a limited project to comply and the buffer zone under the Wetlands Protection Act at the state level is not a resource area. The other reason that we pointed it out is because, you know, technically we are within um, your no disturb zone of the buffer zone locally. So in that sense, we are within your resource area. So it's, it's a bit of a fuzzy line whether or not that technically applies, but it's good information to have everyone understand um, that, you know, there is a big push to have renewable energy for the long-term environmental health of our communities. Can I just ask a few other questions? Um, so I noticed that the area is on a bit of a slope and I may have missed this um, because um, I read it, but I didn't read it in, in great excruciating detail. Um, when you're clearing the land, are you clearing it all at once or are you going to clear it in like stages? Um, so sheet 118, I'll find it for you, is the phasing plan. And while Maria is locating that, it will be cleared in five phases. Yeah, thank you, Maria. So, so okay. there you go. So the, the, the phasing plan is essentially the, these areas as outlined are the areas that we would do and the order that we would clear them in. So we would not be clearing everything at once and we would be stabilizing an area before moving on to start clearing another area. Um, all of these areas are less than 10 acres. Okay. And then um, I didn't see on the, are there retention basins? Are you guys planning on using retention basins anywhere? Yes. Let me, let me jump down to that in a second. <laughs> And Jen, we can stop talking whenever you want. So no, no, I this is great. I encourage these questions. I, you know, a lot of this too. Erin had picked up on um, in her review as particularly the BMPs, like like basins, detention basins. So I'm nodding along. Sheet <laughs> that just shows that. Yes. Okay. So. Starting on sheet 308 of the plans, which is, um, if, if anyone has the full PDF open, it's mm -hmm. page 73. Um, we have details for the detention basin. And they are, I believe, just along the access road in a couple of spots. Um, because those areas are, are steeper and that's what our modeling has shown is needed. Um, 
third. Yes, there's a third one. What BMP are those detention basins? What state uh, in the stormwater BMP handbook, which one do they, are you guys qualifying that as? It's as far as I understand, it's a dry basin. Okay, because I thought that dry basins were pre-treatment BMPs. So is there second, some kind of secondary treatment for those at once the water um, settles and discharges? All of the calculations are in the stormwater report for how they decided what they needed. Um, Right. I'm just wondering if there's a secondary BMP associated with the detention basin um, because they're a pre-treatment BMP. So they're supposed to be um, there's supposed to be a secondary treatment with dry detention basins. I would have to go back into the stormwater report to find more details for you on that. And I also didn't see the TSS removal worksheet, so I wasn't sure because I don't believe um, dry detention basins meet the 80% TSS removal guideline. And Maria, I know you wanted to take time to, to answer you know, some of these detailed questions from Aaron and also from, I know you, there's a list from the DEP as well. So, um, you know, you don't feel like you need to go through this. 100 page thing yeah. right now. I mean, we yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to the stormwater report for you right now. Yeah. Um, but I, I did want to show you the, the sheets in the plan set that had the, the visual details for you on the basins that you were asking about. Um, yeah. So That's helpful. Thank you. Sheet 308 through 310 has those. Um, and they, they have a lot of different views of them for you so that you can see exactly what's being proposed. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I know there's, we're gonna have more time to discuss this in, in subsequent meetings, but um, I'm just gonna be really interested in seeing, you know, like the, the erosion and sediment control plans. Um, that's something that I'll be really uh, wanting to dig in more deeply into. And I'll be wanting to understand the classification of the soils on the site with respect to infiltration and runoff. So literally like what is the data on how you characterized the soils and the capacity of the soils on the site? That is again in the stormwater report. Great, yeah. So if we can just be prepared to talk about that for the next meeting, that would be great. Um. All With right. Respect okay. To um, the plan sheets, the 400 number series is where you'd see the erosion and sediment control details. So, Jen, I'm a little worried that we're hitting the half hour mark and we haven't taken yeah. public comment yet. Yeah. Um, yep. I'm just was just transitioning, but trying to give okay. me a, a, a chance to, to respond to some of these questions. So I think we've moved through the you know presentation of the project, staff comments, commissioner questions, unless anyone else has anything burning. We are going to come back to a pretty technical discussion of this in the next meeting. Um, so unless there's anything else, commissioners, not seeing anything. Um, Jim, could Yep, go ahead, Dave. I just wanted to put a plug in, and, and I apologize, I have not read the materials as thoroughly as some of you, but um, Laura had asked about the phasing, and I think that's something that I'd like to really hear more about at the next meeting. You know, what is that phasing, clear, you know, clearing the site in phases over what period of time, and, and as that relates to um, uh, stormwater uh, control and, and runoff and uh, erosion control. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dave. All right, um, so I want to move to public comments and I'll repeat that um, I want to make sure we hear from as many people as possible, but we're gonna limit each person's comments to two minutes as long as a new point is being made. Um, and as long as that point is germane to the purview of this commission, which is 
um, protecting the wetland and water resources on the site. Um, so with that reminder, um, I'm just, if you are in attendance, um, raise your hand and I will work my way down the list um, and allow you to talk. So the first person I have is Sharon. Sharon, you should be able to, to speak. Okay, hi. Um, first, I just really appreciate you guys at the Conservation Commission for being so careful about this. So I have two questions. One is about the access road and um, Maria, you described it as degraded and I'm actually very familiar with those, with this area and really those, those that area, it's just trails, fairly narrow trails through the woods. And I don't understand them being classified as degraded already and that being a reason why we can go into the buffer zone. And I worry that that's just a way to increase the area that's being clear cut. Um, that, you know, it doesn't seem degraded to me at all. It just seems like a little path going through the woods. Um, so that's a question I have. And I'll just ask my second question, which is um, when you're talking, I keep hearing, um, you talk as if this is a done deal, like we are going to do this and this is what's gonna happen. And um, and I, I don't understand that because this is just an application. And so it's not necessarily for sure gonna happen. It depends on how things go. So it's more like if this is approved and if everything goes well, this is what would happen, not this is what's going to happen. And so I just um, object to that language um, as if it's a done deal. It feels like it's sort of um, pushing something forward that um, is, is not yet a done deal. So that's it. I appreciate that. Sharon, thanks for sticking to two minutes. Um, and I'm gonna ask that we kind of discourse through me on this. So um, I'll first say that you're absolutely right, Sharon. This is an application and you are witnessing our technical review and um, our best efforts to protect the resources on this on this site um, as much as we possibly can um, in terms of Maria's, um, and I think Maria is well aware of that. So we'll continue um, doing the best possible review of this project, this application as we can. Um, I, and I also appreciate your, your observation about the current status on the on the access road on the site. Um, as you can, you've probably heard, um, commissioners are asking if, if there's any way to get the access road out of the BBW, um, kind of regardless of what the current status of the site is there. Um, so we appreciate that point um, and thank you for being here. I should say that this hearing will be continued to the next Conservation Commission meeting, which I think is on November 10th. 10th, yep. 10th. Um, so keep an eye on our website um, and, and please follow along and come, come back. Um, we appreciate you being here. So thank you, Sharon. Um, the next I person. address the, the question about the status of the road. Sure. Um, I'm using the term degraded because it is an old logging road. It is compacted. So there is not much actually growing in it and it has been previously cleared. So with respect to the other buffer zone areas on the site, it is degraded because it does not support wildlife the way that these other areas do. Um, it is absolutely a nice place to walk around. I have been all over this site myself. Great, thank you, Maria. Thank you. Um, the next person I have is Lenore. I'm gonna allow you to talk. Um, I think you're muted. Am I unmuted now? Yep, we gotcha. Okay. And All sorry, right. I should have said, if you could just um, quickly introduce yourself. That would okay. be good. Okay, okay. Well, as you said, my name is Lenore Prick and I live in Amherst. I don't know what other, um, well, I could, I could say that I, um, 
I work with an organization connected to Climate Action Now, which focuses on regenerative farming, forests, and food systems, and, and that connection to climate. Um, so I guess that is way of introduction. Um, so if we're just gonna talk about water and wetlands, which I don't know how we can only talk about one thing because it's connected to everything, but um, you, uh, maybe you know, and maybe some people don't know, that um, forests are intimately connected with water regulation, with wetland protection. Uh, they drive the biotic, the biotic pump sim, sim system, they drive rainfall, um, they mitigate floods, uh, they mitigate droughts, they protect rivers. And so even though this is just a small part of uh, the forested land, if we're, the way that you talk about protecting resources on this site, we seem to like chop up land in our minds as humans, and you can't do that. You can't protect sources on resources on one site without protecting resources in the greater area. It doesn't work like that. Just the way water, you know, up there uh, is connected to water down here, um, all the way from snow down the mountain, down the river to the ocean. And so nothing is is um, separated the way we look at it. And even if we talk about this little vernal pool and that you know part of the ecosystem, um, there's there's a there's a hubris and an ignorance that that we do. And I understand you're just one commission in just one area, but but I'm asking us to have the responsibility to think of ourselves in, as, as the greater ecosystem to protect the ecosystem. Um, and and when, when we disturb one part, we're disturbing the whole ecosystem because, we're, because forests are not just um, trees. They're, they're networks between plants and animal species. They're communication networks. And we're disturbing that no matter what um, we think we're protecting every time we, we cut and clear. And even though this is um, not, well, and, and, and uh, we have to think about soil structure, even though you're only talking about water and wetlands, because the soil structure prevents flooding and droughts, pre prevents erosion into the waters, uh, helps retain and protect the water retention that protects the water quality, helps the microbes to protect from pest and disease infestation, helps biodiversity. We can't separate any of that. And what's happening in our, in our, and I know this is not about, um, your job is not to think about the purpose of this project, but the purpose of this uh, project is supposedly to provide solar as an alternative um, energy source because of the climate chaos that we're in. But to sacrifice the health of a forest ecosystem to do that um, is actually sabotaging the most critical allies we have in healing from climate destabilization. So I'm Thank questioning you, Lenore. the wisdom with, with, of the whole project. Yep, with that, um, that's your two minutes and we you. appreciate your, your holistic input. Thank you. Um, all right, um, our next uh, participant with our hand up is Eric. Eric. I'm allowing you to talk. If you could quickly introduce yourself, you have um, two minutes. Thank you, Jen. Yes, I'm Eric Backrag, and I live on Shutesbury Road in Amherst. And I'd like to thank the Conservation Commission for its hard work and commitment to protecting the environment for all of us. The proposed project south of Shutesbury Road encompasses many significant water and wildlife issues and would be the largest solar project in Amherst to date. It's the first one that calls for the clear cutting of a huge swath, 45 acres in a contiguous forest system. The environmental impact consequences of this project are enormous and irreversible. Most of us are not experts in the issues that this project raises, but we've seen during the very first CONCOM and RAD discussion about this project in 2019, that work done by developers must be validated by outside and independent consultants. Every aspect of this project should be scrutinized from a total environmental impact perspective. We saw how thoroughly you reviewed the initial TRC and RAD report, and we commend you for having recognized the need for a rigorous and careful review of the work completed by TRC, and for having the wisdom to engage independent and expert reviewers. 
the revised wetlands report subsequently prepared by Emily Stockman and Associates cited several inaccuracies in TRC's initial wetlands assessment. The amended ANRAD was eventually accepted by the CONCOM. This project encompasses an area near the Adams Brook, which flows into the Fort River, is not far from the Atkins Reservoir and abuts a neighborhood that relies on its wells. We are concerned that it threatens the area's groundwater recharge system. This project is being proposed within a large and interconnected ecological system at a time when precipitation in the Northeast has increased by 53% since 1996 and the loss of topsoil from stormwater runoff due to deforestation is a serious concern. And now this application is before you again. We're asking that you impose the same rigorous due diligence in evaluating the project's operating assumptions, associated data and technical specific specifications, which directly relate to the project's impact on the environment, on the area's hydrology, on the short and long-term damage to water resource areas, local aquifers and wells, on issues of stormwater runoff control, on soil analysis, and the loss of habitat and damage to wildlife. When I look at the aerial view of this project, it doesn't seem possible that the water resources that are here today could possibly exist after deforesting 45 acres around them. I'm not an expert, but common sense tells me we have some major issues here, and I hope you will insist upon independent, ex extensive, and in-depth environmental impact studies of this project. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, Eric. You're well, welcome. Perfectly two minutes. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to move to Jenny. Uh, Jenny, you should be able to talk if you unmute yourself. A quick introduction and then you have hey, two Can you hear me now? Yes. Hey, I'm Jenny Callick. I also live on Shootsbury Road. Uh, of course, very grateful to the commission for all the work you're doing. I'd like to address the state's attitude towards renewable energy. Seven months ago, Governor Baker signed a landmark bill entitled An Act Creating a Next Generation Roadmap for Massachusetts Climate Policy. A central feature of the new law is the Resilient Lands Initiative, which states that going forward, there should be, quote, no net losses of farms and forests because science has shown that preserving farms and forests and reducing fossil fuel emissions are equally vital to reaching greenhouse gas targets. This has been the law for seven months. I understand that tonight the Conservation Commission begins to consider a proposal to deforest 45 acres, and the Commission will have to find a way to protect the water source and somehow to prevent a stormwater disaster, both, both during and after construction. The TRC notice of intent raises significant concerns as to whether this site is suitable for an in-ground solar installation, and particularly when the state no longer wants forest cut. In addition, consulting the natural resources inventory that AMP submitted to the zoning board, they also found, and this is LEC's environmental consultants, that this particular site requires a series of serious mitigation measures to protect the site's natural resources, its water and wildlife. The site contains, as we know, wetlands and vernal pools, many species and is proximate to an endangered species, which is considered to be important uh, when the site is looked at for cutting. Additionally, it is as we know, adjacent to Adams Brook, which is classified as cold water fish resource, tributary to Fort River and the source of our community's water. I'd like to echo what's been said. We definitely ask the Conservation Commission to look to other 
uh, resources require a peer-reviewed engineering report. And in addition, the services of a wildlife biologist to oversee construction as recommended by the LEC environmental consultants. Thank you for the time. Thank you very much, Jenny, appreciate it. Um, and I, again, if you are joining us for this hearing and you have a comment, um, if you can raise your hand, I see Jerry next. Um, so Jerry, hello, you should be hello. able to- can you hear me? Yep. Hi, I'm Jerry Weiss from uh, South Amherst. And I, I actually just have a question I hope somebody can answer, because I, I understand that you are concerned with water and all of its aspects. Um, and I am very impressed with the preparation that you've all done uh, in having these hearings. So my question is, is there any governmental body that will be looking at the entire uh, ecological effects of such a project, um, the destruction of the forest and all that will entail loss of oxygen production, loss of habitat, et cetera. Is there anybody who's gonna be looking at that before a decision is made? <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> That's a great question. Um... Commissioners, I might need you to chime in on this. I mean, so as you heard, it's in front of zoning as well. Um, but aside from review of relevant town commissions um, in for which, you know, have purview over the specific regulations involved in this project, um, I don't know of a holistic kind of ecosystem scale review that happens. Um, Laura, I know you might have some more perspective on this. And Aaron, please chime in if I'm incorrect on that. No, I'd actually say that I think we're pretty fortunate in Amherst to have a it, it, to have a commission that has um, you know to have a town that has a conservation commission such as this to focus on uh, protecting um, wetlands and so forth. There's plenty of plenty of uh, counties and states that don't have um, boards such as this uh, to review applications. So, um, you know, there are a lot of, there, there's no like holistic review, but of course there are a lot of permits that go into um, constructing a solar farm, so. Yeah, and then, yeah, as I'm, Jerry, you might know, but as Laura is referring to, you know, we have like, I think 350 or 351 communities in Massachusetts and we all regulate the Wetland Protection Act locally. So the fact yeah. that this commission is doing this thorough of a review um, is something that's unique to Massachusetts. It doesn't really answer your question though. Um, and that is that there's not a, a you know holistic ecosystem review that goes into this. Instead it's, you know, done from a regulatory perspective. Yeah, yeah from towns on the commission. Yeah, I do appreciate what you're doing, um, but I am worried about the whole ecology of this project. Hard to, hard to separate it out, but um, that's, our, that's our job, is to do our best yeah. to protect the resource we can under the Wetland Protection Act and our town bylaws. Yeah. Aaron. Jen, 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 could I just, yep, could I Dave? add, I'm just agreeing with you and Laura that there isn't a comprehensive, as, as Jerry, asked a comprehensive review, environmental review, um, within your purview of the ComCom, you know, you will cover certain aspects of the project. I just wanted to also clarify that the project is not before the Zoning Board of Appeals yet. An application has been submitted, mm. but there is, there is not a, a hearing date for the, um, for the project. I also wanted to say that, you know, Amherst at this time does not have a solar bylaw on the books. Many communities in Massachusetts do. It's something that some residents of Amherst are interested in seeing. So they brought that to uh, the planning department's attention. Um, but communities like Belchertown and many communities central in central Mass and West uh, Eastern Mass do have uh, bylaws, solar bylaws on the books. So that's an avenue if people are interested in pursuing. Thanks. Thanks, Dave, very much for that. 
Erin, did you have some, you look like you have something to add? Um, I just wanted to say that we are about um, seven or eight minutes away from having spent an hour on this hearing. Yep. And I would just say maybe we should take one or two more comments and then we should probably try to move on and take more comment at the next meeting. Okay, uh, Maria, I see you. Hold on. So I was just going to say, Aaron, yeah, we have two more people um, with their hands hands up. So we'll take, is that two more comments and we'll keep it to two minutes. Maria, did you have a, a, a response to Jerry or? Yes, um, everyone did a fantastic job covering what happens locally, um, just in case it wasn't clear. These applications get submitted to DEP at the state level and are also reviewed there. And while DEP doesn't actively issue the permit at this stage, it's, it is a local permit. Um, DEP does provide comments and guidance to the commission to help with the review. Um, so those are the comments that we referenced um, earlier in the discussion that came in a little earlier today that DEP has done their review and provided that for all of us to chew on as well. Thank you. That's a great clarification, Maria. And yet, uh, like mm -hmm. I said, and I've said before, Jerry, stay tuned. I mean, what will happen in our next meeting on October 10th is that Maria will come back with kind of responses to Aaron's technical review questions, responses to commissioner questions, and responses to DEP comments and questions. Um, so there's a lot more, more to come on that. Great. In terms of thanks all. Yeah, thanks very much. All right, um, Michael. You should be able to talk if you unmute yourself. Uh, if you could give us a quick introduction and then limit your comments to two minutes, please. Sure, my name is Michael Lipinski. I'm a 30 year resident of Amherst and I live on Shootsbury Road. And um, I have a great statement I've written but it sounds an awful lot like some of the other ones we've heard. So I'm going to spare you that and I'll just submit that in writing. Um, and you can add it to the record. I think what I would like to focus in on though are some specific issues that have been brought up already that as I look at the project and, and try to evaluate it and look for um, pros and cons, I'd like to bring to your attention some of the things you've, you've kind of um, taken a look at, some of the things I don't think you have. And one of the areas that I would hope that you would look at is it seemed like in the project, they were using a, a pretty basic soil map that was um, you know, just pretty generic. And it didn't look like there was any attempt by the developer to actually go out there and see what the soils really were. And I would urge you guys to um, put that as a requirement because I don't think those soil maps are that accurate. And I think that because erosion uh, is such an issue with this and, and uh, protection of the water is so, such an issue, I think it's really critical that we actually know what the soils are not just go by some generic map that I think has been proven not to be very accurate on other projects. Um, along with that, slope is also a very important issue on this and some of you guys have brought that up already. Um, one thing that I found valuable was at the Wheelock project up in Shootsbury, they had, a, they had a slope analysis map. And basically it's an overlay of the whole project that I'm, you know, I know you guys can read contour lines, et cetera, but it's not always easy to do it at a glance. And basically it's just a colored map that overlays the project, which at a glance gives a person a good idea where things slope, where is it steeply slope, where is it flat? And I found that to be very useful in understanding the Wheelock project. And I think it would be very useful if the developers did one of those for you. I don't think it's much work and it makes things clear. Along with that, obviously one of the biggest issues with this project is the Adams Brook. And unfortunately, the contour maps that you're looking at in this development only show you the contours of the, of the property. And that makes sense on one level, but on another level, it doesn't make sense at all because if you go to the Southeast corner of that, of that project and you look at the contours there, it doesn't look that bad. But if you step off that map, another 50, 100 feet, you see that the slope down to the Adams Brook is almost, it's almost a cliff. And it concerns me after watching what happened in Williamsburg and the kind of issues they had there with runoff from a site very similar to this. It concerns me that, that once that water gets moving down that slope, 
it would have very easy access to Adamsbrook. And I think that should be one of your, your main considerations in evaluating this project. Thank you, um, Michael. That's about okay. two minutes. So I'm going to cut you off, unfortunately. Um, I think most of those, we, I appreciate um, those additional thoughts. I think um, in terms of uh, classifying the soils, um, we did, I think we brought that up a couple of times and I know Maria um, will be addressing that when we see her again um, on the 10th. Uh, and I appreciate your your thoughts on on other ways to look at the the slope on the pro on the site. Um, that's point taken. Um, okay, last participant, Phil. You should be able to talk. Right, give us your, a you can hear me. Yep. Okay. Minutes, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Phil Rich. Yep. <clears throat> I and I'm, I'm uh, also on shoot three road. I'm one of the abutters. Uh, so first of all, thanks to the commission uh, and really the expertise, you know, on the commission is, is uh, it's good to see. So thank you very much. I'm really going to reiterate in some ways and maybe just add a little edge, really what's been said about, you know, potential, the larger ecology, you know, the effect on the groundwater, the slope, uh, the effect on the soils. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not sure, if, is it within the commission's purview to be thinking about, right, the uh, overall, the impact of the land outside of those 45 acres, up and down the road. And uh, so I think that it, it, it's, from my perspective, it isn't just about the installation itself and, and its ecology. And as, as I think it was Jerry who talked about the much, much larger ecology, uh, right, we're somewhere in between uh, as a part of So I think that's, I hope the commission is also gonna be looking at that. I, I, I think I'm particularly concerned about that in addition to everything that's already been said very well. So that's it for me. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Phil. Um, I think, you know, as you've deduced it, you know, we have to deal with the application in front of us, but there are ways that we control or can help mitigate impacts to water, which is a flowing resource. So you've heard our focus on stormwater and sediment management. So there's a lot of concern about increased erosion and increased runoff. And that is something that would certainly flow downstream. Um, so focused on that aspects of the resource that we can help protect um, is the way that we help protect the Adams Brook, for example, downstream of the site. Yeah. Um, so it's not a perfect system, but we're doing the best I can we can with the, the levers we have here. Okay, I appreciate it. Yep. All right. I think that was our last hand. Um, so unless anyone else has so any final questions or issues to flag um, for Maria, um, then I think what we're looking for is a motion to continue. Oh, I see Maria has a hand. Um, um, there, there are a bunch of things that have been brought up this evening. Um, and in terms of having a, a clear process forward. Um, I, I was hoping that we could have a couple minutes just to clarify um, what's happening next. Um, the verification of the soil map accuracy has not been done. Um, so based on the conversation, I believe that the commission wants that done. So if I could get confirmation on that so that we can get it scheduled. <laughs> yes, actual soil pit. Sorry, Aaron, go ahead. So no, so, okay. Um, As has, we suspected, we need soil pits here. <laughs> right, okay. I just wanna ask one more question. Has, has depth to groundwater been confirmed on the site for the design of the stormwater systems? Have, the, have there been exploratory borings to determine the surface to groundwater elevation for the design of the stormwater on the site? My understanding is that test pits of any kind have not been done at this point. Okay. It, it, it is very common to use the soil maps. There are other counties where they are more relied upon than this okay. one. Um, so, so yeah, so it provide information for what is expected in the area. Yeah, so bef before- have, like, smaller soil profiles from when we did the delineation work, but those are not what you need for the um, no. 
for the stormwater design. Yeah, I would say we need we need to confirm soils and we need to determine depth to groundwater immediately um, because there's no way to determine if the stormwater systems are going to function are going to function as intended without knowing where the groundwater is on the site. We have a decent idea of where it is. We know where it comes out in the wetlands because there are very steep slopes there. But uh, your your point is taken. Um, I'm I'm just trying to put together a list so that we know what we're going to be talking about at the next meeting, and that so we know what to be expecting. Yeah, um, I'm, and I'm wondering, Maria, are you going to need more than two weeks to? to do that work? Because if so, I mean, I would almost recommend that we continue to the second meeting in November to give you more time. Because I think that that's going to take some time. Frankly, the, the way this has been done, where we've been told we can't tell you a whole lot about the project this evening um, is a little atypical. Um, I understand you have a lot on your schedule and that this has already run longer than you were hoping because you have a lot on your schedule. Um, but with, with respect to what others have already brought up, um, we're hoping to know the commission's intent, um, around a peer reviewer. If, if the commission wants a peer review, we're supportive of however the commission wants to review this. Um, but if, yeah, and we'd like to know that that process can be kicked off. I mean, with all due respect, we can't start with a peer review until the data has been collected in the field. Like it would be putting the cart before the horse to say we're going to hire a peer reviewer if there's no data for them to review. They, if they don't have confirmed soil borings to look at, if they don't have conf confirmed, um, you know, with, with all respect, you have almost 400 pages for them to review and they may have different questions than you have that we would all answer. I don't necessarily yeah. think this is a great use of time you right now. To understand judge. that you yeah. may not be able to Hang on, hire someone right this second, but we would like to know if it is your intent to hire someone. That's what we are asking. And I think that that's something that the commission should be able to talk about. I mean, it's a complex project. The commission is either comfortable reviewing something of this complexity or they feel like they should have additional help. So I would just say there's a lot of missing information. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, there's, there's a lot of missing information and pieces of information that we need in order to even do a review of the 400 and some odd pages that were submitted to us and to, to use that data to confirm if the regulations, you know, if, if there's compliance with the regulations based on the application. So um, and, and I also think that when we've, have we've been, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, just, I was just, I was still yeah. speaking. Um, so we've, we've already been in the hearing for over 60 minutes and to bring this up when we've been in the hearing for an hour is this is another half an hour conversation. So my recommendation to the board would be, let's get answers to the question, technical questions that we need answers to, the answers to the DEP comments, revisit it at the meeting as planned on the 10th, and then let them move forward with their data collection in the field that's currently missing from the application. If it's prepared by the 10th, then we'll have it to move forward and render a decision. If it's not, then we'll continue to the 24th. That would be my recommendation. I wholeheartedly agree with that recommendation. I think that there's just, we need more data um, to even conduct a, a third party's review of even just the stormwater plan. Right. So um, is, yeah, so I think Maria, the plan would be that we continue into the next meeting. And if you can do the due diligence to answer DEB comments, answer Aaron's review comments and collect any data in order to answer those comments. Um, that would be the best way to move forward. So um, commissioners, I think we're looking for a draft motion. I'll make the motion um, to move to continue the public hearing for Shootsbury Road, um, notice of intent to November 10th at 7.35 p.m. Second. Second. I'm gonna go to Anna with that one. All right, voice vote, Anna. Aye. 
Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Oh, it's doing that weird thing again, Michelle. Yeah. I, I, I. There we go. Leroy. Hi. Uh, Laura. Hi. Fletcher. Hi. Larry. Hi. And I'm an I as well. Um, thank you for being here, Maria and Andrew. Um, and we look forward to seeing you again on the 10th. Thank you all for your time. Really appreciate it. Looking forward to it. See you soon. See you soon. Thank you. All right. Erin, is there a way to set that agenda item for more? I think it was set for like five minutes today. Is there just thinking ahead for whatever hearings following them next time? Yeah, so the strategy with that is that because a lot of these hearings some require and sometimes in an unexpected manner continuations um, and the continuations come in last minute. So if we set a half hour or an hour block of time, then we're sitting there waiting for the next hearing to start. Right. And and sense. so I what I usually tell applicants is five minute intro, five minutes for questions, five minutes for comments from staff, five minutes for public comment, and we aim for about 20 minutes. And obviously in a situation like this, we're aiming for half an hour, but things happen. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of a bummer, but unfortunately, I, I, that's how I would recommend we do it, it unless the board feels differently. Nope, that makes total sense. I Thank you for explaining that. Sorry yeah. for taking a few minutes for it. Go ahead, that's sorry. Okay. Uh, that's why it's it's tricky to look at the ad agenda because you never know how long it's going to actually be. Um, all right, so we'll move now that it's 843, we'll move to our 735 um, hearing and that is a continuation. It's the um, ANRAD um, SWCA for Confirmation of Resource Area Boundaries at 52 Fearing Street. Um, and so I know I have Mickey, I'm going to promote you to a panelist. Should be joining at any moment. Hi, Mickey. Was there anyone else? You're muted. I don't know if there's anybody else on, so I think it's me. Um, I, I will make it quick because I know you've just spent a long time in that last meeting. Yeah. Uh, it was interesting <laughs> listening in. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, thank you for being here. Um, I just want to reiterate for everyone, because I know we also have a lot of interest in this hearing, um, that the format we are again going to attempt to follow is um, a brief introduction and five minute project overview and update um, from the applicant. In this case, that's SWCA and, and Mickey Marcus is here representing the, the applicant. Um, and then we'll do five minute report out from the staff, and in this case, that's Aaron. And um, for this hearing, that will be an overview of a finding of fact with respect to the perennial versus intermittent status of Tanbrook. Um, and then we'll do five minutes of question and answer from the commission. And we've really kind of been back and forth through this one, guys. So we'll really try to get to five, five minutes on this one. Um, and then again, um, we welcome uh, comments from the public, but um, once again, uh, please keep them germane to uh, the jurisdiction of the commission. And also um, please try to avoid repetition. Um, we understand the difficulties involved in this, the complexities involved in this project and we're doing the best we can, uh, but we need to keep moving. So with that, um, Mickey, could you please introduce yourself and give us a, a brief overview and update on the project? Yeah, I'm Mickey Marcus. I'm a wetland scientist with SWCA. I live in Amherst. Um, Jen, with your permission, may I share a screen of the map? Yes, please do. Okay. Um, you know, I, I just submitted uh, this plan uh, to the commission this afternoon, so I, I'm not expecting uh, any major decisions. I, I just want to uh, point out that I, this is a revised wetland map. Um, uh, Emily Stockman reviewed it. Uh, I would say the really all the changes that Emily had suggested are included in the map. Uh, the primary area is this area right in here. It's a, um, we added a little bit of VVW here. And then there's a funny, um, like a historic um, 
ditch or channel or swale. Um, and Emily, it's about three to four feet wide. Um, Emily suggested that it should be included as a town bylaw intermittent stream. It's uh, I, I helped write the bylaw in Amherst and it probably does meet that definition. It doesn't drain any upgradient wetlands, but it's just a historic structure and it does fill with water during rainstorms. Uh, it doesn't really have flow. So anyway, I um, included that. It's, it's about uh, almost 1300 square feet. Uh, so that's been included. Um, I did not change the, uh, our assessment of the perennial or intermittentness of Tambrook, or we're calling it intermittent. Uh, and that's because when I follow the DEP regulations on how to classify the stream, it comes out as intermittent. And I, I know that, you know, the commission had sent um, kind of a, an alternate definition. I, I think it's wrong um, and I'm happy to go through that with you. But basically there are two reasons why I think this section of Hamburg should be considered intermittent. And I sent you a letter, like, again, um, we can discuss it now or, or at a subsequent meeting, but uh, DP regulations require a review of the current USGS map. And the current USGS map does not show the stream as perennial. Um, so, you know, the commission, you know, had sent a map from 1901, uh, 1941. They don't count. They're not the current map. And historic, you know, we know that wetlands get changed and altered and modified over time. And so we're looking at you know, the existing conditions and that's the current USGS map, not shown as perennial. Then the second part of the equation is that DEP says, okay, well, use stream stats. It's a USGS tool for measuring watersheds and stream. Um, we did that and the, the watershed area comes out to be 0.46, uh, square miles, about 294 acres, less than a threshold of a half a square mile. And, and again, you know, the commission, you know, in previous writing said they don't think stream stats is correct. I, I think you just have to follow the regulation. So I'm not really sure why, you know, the commission is considering changing the, the rules. Um, but uh, in this application, you know, the same way we delineate BVW, more than 50% wetland plants, we just follow the rules that DEP gives us. Uh, if the town bylaw has alternate regulations, we will follow those. But in just following the procedures and the rules, this stream channel should be considered intermittent. You know, and, and just to point out, I know every site is different, every site is unique, but you know, the commit this same commission did issue uh, an ORAD saying that the stream was in fact perennial after the head wall at UMass. That was a decision, a previous decision that this commission made. So I, I think it's very inconsistent to sort of modify decisions and consider it perennial. So that's, that's what I've submitted. I've submitted some documentation. I submitted a watershed map, revised wetlands, uh, incorporating Emily's suggestions. Uh, it's really, you know, at this point, I don't have anything new to say. It's up to the commission to either accept uh, the map or issue your modified uh, determination of wetland boundaries and resource areas. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks, Mickey. Um, so I think, again, like, like Mickey said, everyone, um, this revised plan showing um, Emily suggested revisions to the resource area boundaries um, was just received at the end of the day today. So uh, we haven't had time to review this and make sure that it corresponds with Emily's edits. Um, I know she had a lot of like detailed uh, suggestions in there that we'd like time um, to review. I also think um, with respect to the discussion of the designation of Tanbrook as perennial versus intermittent, um, you know, we're following the guidance we've received from town council, which is that we can do a finding of fact um, and 
given you know the DEP regulations on designation of perennial versus intermittent, there are other um, avenues you can follow to designate a stream. Um, so Aaron has done, um, actually, Mickey, if I can ask you to stop sharing for a second. Yeah, I will do so. That would be great. Um, so town staff um, has gone to great effort to do a very reproducible, um, very scientifically strong uh, finding a fact around the designation of Tan Brook. So Mickey, are, it sounds like you're you're all set for your project overview. Um, Aaron, do you want to take the you know five minutes or less of um, staff comment to walk us through the finding of fact here? Sure. So um, I have been learning about Tanbrook like all of you, and um, my first um, effort was to look at historic topos because they may not be 100% accurate, but they are very interesting in showing where resource areas were historically, since we know that humans have drastically altered the landscape. Um, but anyway, so sort of the beginning is just to note, because I, I do understand where Mickey is coming from as far as the, um, the current USGS topo. Um, and obviously, this is not the most current. This is 1901, but you can see um, that Tanbrook is identified as a solid blue line in 1901. And then again in 1941, you can see um, on Faring Street that um, Faring is shown, or I'm sorry, Tanbrook is shown as a solid blue line coming into the campus pond. So it was historically mapped um, on the USGS topo. And then sometime um, between 1941 and 1971, significant portions of the Tanbrook were piped underground. This starting from up at the um, Wildwood Cemetery, there's a pond at the base of Wildwood Cemetery. The, um, it's culverted underneath Wildwood School um, fields, underneath the junior high school fields, underneath the high school playing fields down. Um, it, it may daylight a portion of it daylight between the high school and the middle school, but then it also highlights behind um, Bertucci's parking lot for a short stint. There are a lot of inputs to Tanbrook and um, because of topography and because of the change in the development of the downtown landscape, it's, it's um, once we reach 1971, it's no longer shown on the USGS topo. And then of course, in 2021, it's not shown on the USGS topo, but you, you can see the contour lines where um, they follow the, um, the contour of the stream bed where it is daylighted from, I think, McClellan down. <laughs> and um, there, there was significant information shared with me initially when this permit was filed and, you know, to. To Mickey's point about um, wetlands changing all the time, wetlands do change all the time, development changes all the time. This um, watershed is unique in that it is a major stormwater basin. So a lot of the inputs to the stream are actually coming from stormwater infrastructure like catch basins, um, culverts, it could be coming from people's septic systems, it could be coming from all kinds of places. Um, and so in order to capture that, um, you know, initially, of course, the applicant looked at the um, stream stats application and documented that the the um, watershed was 0.44 square miles in size and so, provided this map to us. Um, Aaron, can I just back up one second? So to segue yes. from um, the first part of the DEP regulation where it, it requires that the stream is shown as a solid blue line on a map. There's right. also acknowledging that if that's not the case, there are other possible qualifying factors for intermittent versus perennial streams. And those Correct. are the things that Aaron has highlighted here. So first Correct. is a watershed size of at least a half a square mile. And the second is um, involving the flow rate. So in the subsequent part of the analysis, Aaron went through and confirmed, you know, she did a very detailed finding of fact about what the actual drainage area of and Brooke delineated from the bottom of the, the ANRAD in question. So just so people know where we're headed next is um, a detailed review of, of what that drainage area looks like. 
Correct. Yep. Thank you so for that. No, thank you. Thank you. Cause it gets, cause it gets lost in translation sometimes. Yep. Um, so, and the stream stats report, uh, this is what the, the applicant stream stats report look like. And um, you can see if you look closely at the stream stats report, it doesn't even include the, the um, pond, which is right where the little hand is sitting. Um, also the, the, edge here, so like this point right here where my the hand of my cursor is, um, it doesn't extend all the way up the hill to the UMass water towers, which there's a slope there, so it would be capturing um, stormwater on that hillside as well. And um, there is documented um, stormwater infrastructure up there as well. Um, as well, there's stormwater infrastructure in downtown that comes into this watershed, which is documented through the town's utility data. Um, but it, the discrepancies with stream stats have been documented in um, in published research bodies, and that that was a lot of the information that was initially sent to me. That was like, hold on a second, something is wrong here. And so I read that information, and started this sort of independent project again through the town attorney to try to determine what is what is our best course forward with determining the correct watershed boundary. So the first thing that I did was um, look at the um, DEMs, the digital elevation model, and um, I ran some watershed analysis tools of the DEM to try to determine the extent of the watershed just based on topography. And again, based on that analysis, um, the the Tanbrook watershed does extend up to the um, past up to and past the Wildwood Elementary School and the Wildwood Cemetery. Um, surrounding topography, the high point is at the UMass water tower and at the top of the hill at Wildwood Cemetery, which isn't captured in that initial um, report that was provided by um, SWCA and, and stream stats. And again, you know, this entire upper portion is, is missed by the stream stats report. Um, also, again, town drainage structures, um, catch basins are located um, in that area and drain into this area. So it's capturing that stormwater as well. And this is the results of the um, flow accumulation model from the digital elevation model, which these little, excuse me, oops, these little red lines here are coming down. Um, these show that the topography that it's capturing water from these areas and bringing it down into the watershed. And then so again, Oh, go ahead. To clarify at this point, what we're saying is the delineation conducted by the stream stats tool, which is, is essentially doing the same thing that Aaron's doing. We're saying we disagree with the delineation. So Aaron has done a finding of fact to show that if you delineate it with a digital elevation, elevation model in ArcGIS, you can end up with a larger drainage area just to like catch everyone up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. And then this is the, the south end of the watershed. And again, um, the Tanbrook watershed extending down into Amherst Center. Um, there are uh, documented drainage structures draining westerly from Kellogg Ave, from the parking lot in the, at the Bang Center parking lot, and drainage, drainage structures at the intersection of North Pleasant Street, which drain, uh, drain down the hill. And again, the, the um, flow accumulation model does show that there is water moving from that area downhill toward the um, Tanbrook watershed. So once I got the watershed pretty well delineated um, based on the um, tools that I ran on the digital elevation model, um, I used the edit basin feature in stream stats to capture a more accurate boundary of the watershed um, in order to use the stream stats program to extract the information we were looking for regarding watershed size and flow rate. And in doing so, um, I was able to document that the watershed is 0.5 square miles and that the 99% um, flow duration is 0.118, which exceeds the predicted flow rate uh, less or greater than or equal to 0.01 cubic feet per second, which is um, stated in the regulations as um, it has to be greater than that to be, it has to be greater than 0.01 cubic feet per second um, to be a perennial stream. And just to clarify, a flow duration is a, is a likelihood of exceedance of that flow. 
So what we're saying is there's a likelihood of exceedance higher than the regulated likelihood of exceedance of flow in the stream. Thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> I'm, writing, I'm writing paragraph breaks for you. <laughs> no, I. this is great. Um, so this is sort of the end result of my watershed analysis um, showing the um, contours, the USGS contours um, defined below it. And also you can't see that, see it, but there is also the, um, um, the flow data is also included in there. And then this is based, this is just an explanation of what my analysis was based on. Um, the, the data so that it could be replicated by anybody who wants to, to have a look at it. Thanks, Aaron. Um, okay, so Mickey, we, we kind of delayed this conversation from our last hearing because we wanted to have a chance to you know, share with you the finding of fact and the work that Aaron's done um, and kind of be able to have a discourse about it. It seems like you, can, I don't know, I, I guess I should give you a, ch a chance to respond if um, you would be willing to move forward with a, a designation of what we found as a perennial designation of Tan Brook. Uh, yeah, if I can, uh, can, I, can I share a screen, another screen, Jen? Sure. Okay. Um, so I, I submitted uh, this plan. This was after one of the hearings where uh, the commission asked for uh, a more detailed um, assessment of uh, the watershed area. So it, it did get expanded um, by, uh, this is a 0.46 square miles. And I guess I, I just have to say, I object to mm -hmm. the commission changing the rules. Um, you know, you're saying that follow the wetland regulations, but whereas uh, DEP regulations say, follow the stream stats, you're saying stream stat doesn't work, we're gonna use an alternate method. And I, I just think that's the wrong approach. I think that um, in your decisions, you should follow whatever the rules and regulations are. And I think you're, you're exceeding that. So, um, yeah, you vote any way you want on this, but um, I, I think I'm laying down you know, my argument that uh, we follow certain rules and expect uh, you know, the commission to you know, do your job and uphold the wetland regulations. And, and I also think that if you don't like stream stats or don't like the way this is evaluated, you know, change your bylaw. So you have uh, a way to evaluate um, streams and watersheds differently in town so yeah noted thank you for that i think our um commission we should discuss whether we want to accept this designation of of tanbrook as perennial for you know next but i just would say i don't think it's a question of whether it, it's not that we're not following the regulations we are following the regulations we found an error with stream stats which is a tool for this delineation so it's not a question of liking it or not liking it it's that the fact is that the contributing area to this point in Tan Brook would mean that Tan Brook would be designated as a perennial stream. And that's kind of the result of this analysis. Um, so I guess commission, does anyone else have any questions particularly about Aaron's analysis? And then Aaron, it sounds like you have some input and guidance. Um, Anna, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, it's a quick one. So all right, so we're saying we found an inaccuracy in stream stats. Have we reached out to USGS? Have we reached out to the folks who kind of are, are controlling the, and I, I'm hoping Aaron, you've got a quick and easy answer for me on that because if there's an error, should do they want to fix it on their end um, as well so that everything is aligned? I'll let you take that one, Aaron. So I just wanna say two things quickly. The first is that I spoke with the town attorney and the town attorney told me that According to my analysis, we are following the regulations, following them step by step. Is it shown on USGS? No. If it's not shown on the USGS, but has a watershed size greater than this, look in stream stats. Stream stats, it doesn't spe specify in stream stats in the regulations if it's a stream stats um, algorithm that's run or why does it contain an edit basin feature if that option is available to us when we know there's an inaccuracy. 
So um, that's what we our recommendation was from the town attorney. And he said that that was our best um, path forward as far as meeting the regulations on reviewing this. So I just sort of wanted to counter what was said that we're not following the regs. Um, and yes, I have been in touch with USGS about the discrepancy in the algorithm that's the automatic algorithm that's that runs in stream stats when you place a point and they are aware of it and I, I am doing everything in in the background that I possibly can to collect data on Tanbrook. Um, working with UMass on potentially two independent separate studies, um, gauging the flow of Tanbrook so that we can get a sense of the flow of the stream. Because anybody who's seen Tanbrook, if you just look at it, it does not look like an intermittent stream. I've seen many intermittent streams. Generally, you can hop over. This one's almost 20 feet wide. The first time I saw it, my jaw dropped and I'm like, this is not intermittent. But, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's on the USGS radar. It's on the DEP radar. We're going to push everything we can to collect information and try to apply some pressure so that something can be done to correct this error in the program. Um, yeah, so I guess the other thing I'd say about that is just that measuring flow in a stream is a really easy thing to say, but it's actually a very hard thing to do. Um, so when Erin says that she's working with a group at UMass to do it, rating a stream means that you continually monitor stage and then you have to take volumetric flow measurements at different stages and then literally relate discharge to stage, create a rating in order to measure the stream. And that's something that requires catching a full range of the hydrologic conditions at the site. And that can take anywhere from a year, if you're super duper lucky to 10 years. Um, so it's not something that is like, go out there, take a measurement and then it's done. We have to understand the entire range of flow in the stream. Um, so that's just not trivial, which is why trying to understand the drainage area was the first approach. Um, yeah, so good question. Thank you, Erin. Um, any other commissioners, any other comments or questions at this point? Okay, um, Erin. Can, can I just add one, one, one point? Sure. Uh, just so the commission knows, there's a, a procedure in, in Wetland Facts Act regulations for challenging whether a stream is um, intermittent when it's shown as perennial. And there's, there's a procedure that you go through, and DEP requires video and monitoring. Um, and, and, and so there are many streams shown on USGS maps as perennial that have, in fact, been reversed. Uh, and have determined to be uh, intermittent. There, there's no procedure the opposite way. Uh, yeah. So uh, the presumption is if it's not on a USGS map, uh, it's intermittent. Uh, if it's shown as intermittent on a USGS map, it's intermittent. If it has a uh, smaller watershed area, a uh, half a square mile or less, it's intermittent. So those are the presumptions. Um, and I, I guess I'm just asking the commission to follow the rules and follow what the DEP regulations say. I'm not trying to force anything that doesn't make sense, but I'm, we're, we're just following the regulations and our expectation is the commission's gonna do the same. Right. So I think it's down to kind of, we both think that we're following the regulations and expect the others to do the same and we disagree on how we follow the regulations. So I think the first thing is that we have to make a decision as a commission that we, um, how we are, if we're accepting Aaron's finding a fact, the town staff finding a fact um, first. So I don't think we procedurally need to vote. Is that Aaron, do we need to vote on accepting the finding of fact with Tanbrook as perennial versus intermittent? Or I would recommend whatever your finding be that you do make a motion to that effect okay. as to for this, for this specific site, um, what you're considering the status of it to be that way it's clear, it's on the record, and um, then the applicant will have some guidance moving forward, and it's not a matter of arguing it again and again. Yep, okay. Big All right. For that. Um, that well, so road? it's not about the application. It's a sub topic um, that we need to make a decision on in order to move forward with reviewing the ANRAD. Um, so I feel like the public comment isn't necessary. The public comment should come about the application. 
the resource area delineation. This is a question of what the resource is that we're delineating. Um, so my instinct would be that we need to make this decision and then we can discuss with Mickey what kind of our, how we're gonna move forward with this application. Um, and then we can take public comment. Unless if the commission, if the commission feels like it's at an impasse, um, and you need more time, you can you can take more time to consider it. But um, well, let's let's kind of get a feel for this. Yeah. Is, does anyone have concerns about accepting Aaron's finding of fact and designating Tanbrook as perennial? No, I don't. Okay, no concerns from Larry. I'm not seeing anything from anyone else. So I think we might be close to a consensus that we would accept Tanbrook as as designate Tanbrook as perennial. We're talking I think about we should, designating yeah. Tanbrook the whole thing or just only this Tanbrook upstream of the downstream most point on this right. property on the property in the application. Right. But the power that that yields is on this property and this property alone. This would have to be done every individual property that has an application before the board. Right. The other option, just to be clear, is that we would pause this entire, like continue this project until we were able to fully see this through with stream stats fixing their data. Right, or just accepting stream. I understand that that's, that's one, it doesn't seem like that's the direction we're going, but that, that would be the third alternative is that we fully pause everything until everybody is on the same page, stream stats and uh, Aaron's data, is that right? I mean, I, from what I understand, it would be an undertaking of an entire study by USGS. Well, I totally to, understand that. Yeah, I, and, and that we don't even have funding to um, initiate. So that could be years down the road. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to hold up this. <laughs> um, okay, well, so why don't we take a vote? on the designation of Tanbrook. Well, why don't we take a vote on the finding of fact first? And the net result is that of what it does. Right, so it's a vote, it's a motion to accept Aaron's finding of fact, thereby designating. And, and, to, yeah, and to say that we therefore find Tanbrook not to be intermittent. Okay, so I need a motion to accept Aaron's finding of fact. That would mean that we thereby designate Tanbrook as perennial. So move. <laughs> I think Sorry. Larry Larry got that That's one. Fine. We just we got done think? saying it, so I didn't think it had to be repeated. I know. We need a second. We're just doing we this for the record. Yes, we need a second. Okay. Anna's okay. got the second. Okay, voice vote. Anna. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Laura. Oh, sorry. Aye. Larry. I and I'm an I. Okay, with that, Mickey. Um, so I, think I would just ask you to close the hearing and issue your ORAD. Okay, so we can't issue the ORAD unless we have Riverfront shown on the plan. Well, okay, so hold on one second. If he's asking us to close the hearing, then we would basically be saying that we were not confirming the resource area boundaries on the site. Um, right. The end result would be that we were saying um, that we are confirming the, that the um, boundaries described in the reference plans and the abbreviated notice of resource area delineation were found to be inaccurate and cannot be confirmed and then list the resource areas specifically. And I would suggest if the commission does close the public hearing that we would um, actually issue the ORAD at the next meeting because um, we, I would have to do a more extensive finding of fact regarding the revision that was provided to us um, at 2 p.m. this afternoon because Emily hasn't looked at that yet and um, we, can't, we can't confirm those boundaries without her final um, approval of them. Okay, so let me make sure I understand what you're saying, Erin, is if that we close the hearing tonight, you have to do a detailed list of the
the resource boundaries that are missing from the plan. And in order to do that, you need to be able to compare Mickey's plan to Emily's third-party review. Exactly. Yep. Okay. And then and then cite that in a finding of fact, in addition to the um, the Tanbrook finding of fact that you guys just voted on. Okay. So that it's all whole. It includes all resource areas, not just riverfront. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and that's just an artifact of not having time, opportunity, and time to review the plan submitted today. Just because we need materials, you know, at least forty-eight hours before these meetings, so we have time to fully review them. Um, but I, but I don't. Um, I wouldn't if 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 Mickey feels that that's the direction that he wants to go then I wouldn't dissuade the commission from going that direction because I think DEP may need to get involved in this case and voice an opinion on this situation. And, and, and if we are wrong in our approach, then DEP should, should supersede our decision and give them their permit. And if we are right, then DEP should uphold our decision. And either way, we shouldn't be holding up their application further um, with these with this lack of clarity that we're all trying to find the right path. Yep. Appreciated. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we need to take public comment. We have both Rolf and Maria here again. Um, so let's do that. Um, I'll repeat, um, if you're here for the hearing about the SWCA application for an ANRAD at 52 Fearing Street, um, please raise your hand. We are limiting um, public comment to two minutes per person. And if you could please kind of avoid repetition and stick to um, comments about the resource and the issues germane to this commission, um, I'd really appreciate it. So um, Rolf, I'm allowing you to talk. Thank you, commissioners. I realize in the last few meetings, I haven't introduced myself. For th so thanks for bringing that into this meeting. It's important. Rolf Karlstrom, 73 Fearing Street, just across the street from the 52 Fearing Street property. And I've lived on my property for 21 years now with Tanbrook running through the property. And I've said this before, but I wanna reiterate that the stream has never been dry in 21 years, including very severe drought periods through in Amherst when we had water shortages and we were having water restrictions. I wish I had taken pictures. I wish I had done a video um, every year. I'm not sure that would have held up. I know it's anecdotal. Um, I'm very glad that we have a real flow rate um, analysis going on right now because this is a perennial stream. So I applaud you on that, um, Aaron in particular, and the commission on actually doing the data to correct an error that comes from this tool that um, was used by the applicant. Um, two, two, a couple comments on the applicant's presentation. Um, they had completely left out a, a large area of drainage in the original um, application, which I find amazing for a wetlands consultant, a full on pond with the drainage that leads to that pond that feeds into the creek. So I think that, you know, that's, um, that's, that's an egregious or mistaken identification of the wetlands. And so I think this more careful analysis is really important and was done much, much more accurately. And I agree with it. Um, the water flow data, yes, indeed, wetlands change over time. The last 20 years, in fact, it's never gone dry. So that USGS map needs to be revised. And thank you for that effort to get it changed. It is, uh, again, it's not never um, dry. And finally, in terms of consistency, yes, indeed, consistency would be to say this is perennial, just as much as it would be to say it was intermittent for this property, because as you've heard, Gabor Lukacs across the stream on the very other side of this from the property had a ruling of perennial for this same stretch of stream. So I think all of those points um, you've already addressed in, in your vote. My question now is, what just happened? I'm confused by this movement to not um, actually act on this very diligent and hard um, you know, effort that led to this particular um, a lot of work by Aaron and the commission, and we were here every week. I know that, that Mr. Marcus was not here at the last meeting when we were first supposed to discuss this. So what just happened and what's the consequences of the decision you're making right now to um, not, I'm assuming, act on this um, finding? Um, let me hear what, I, I just wanna stop there and, and hear, what, hear what the answer is. Thank you. 
Yeah, thanks for those comments. Um, yeah, so we are acting on it. So, I mean, what what we just voted as a commission that we are accepting the finding of fact prepared by town staff. Um, we believe we're following the regulations as outlined in, in by the DEP. Um, and so we're figuring out how to move forward. So we've said as a commission that we agree with the finding of fact, we accept the finding of fact that Tanbrook is perennial. And so then the question becomes, where do we go with this resource area delineation application? Um, because the plans submitted don't designate, don't, yeah, they don't delineate all the resources we believe are on this or we know are on the site. So we're figuring out how to move, move forward with that. So um, that, that Mr. Marcus now is, is charged with re, re, reapplying. The applicant is, has to reapply based on this new finding. That's what it sounds like. Um, well, so he can either read add the additional delineation necessary because we have said that we think Tanbrook is perennial and we believe we're following state regulations in that designation. Or he, as he said, let's close the hearing, in which case we would actually have to continue to the next meeting in order to detail exactly which resource delineations are missing from, from the resource area delineation as presented, but we would just close the hearing. We would not be accepting the resource area delineation. And so they would have the opportunity to appeal to DEP and then DEP would review our finding, our finding of fact and our decision, and they would either uphold our decision or they, and, and typically when they uphold our decision, they say then to the applicant, you have to revise your plans and go back to the commission, in which case they'd have to come back to us with the revised plans showing all of Emily's edits, all with Riverfront shown on the plan and, and get, get through the process again, or DEP would supersede our decision if they think that procedurally something was incorrect about the way that we've gone about doing it. Um, okay. So, so I guess the bottom line is neighborhood vigilance is called for. We will continue to be tuning in um, and keep looking at your agendas. I think this one was supposed to be 7.30. I'm not sure what time it is now, but I, yeah. I heard your discussion about that last time. This has been an inordinate amount of time, Mr. Marcus, and I was not looked on favorably from my part that you just did not show up at the last meeting, just so you know. Um, the applicant has not won any favor by the process here, but that's not for here, neither here nor there. We will stay vigilant and we will look forward to the next phase of this application. Okay, yeah, and I'd like to remind that, you know, we're gonna have comments come through me um, and we wanna remain respectful of everyone's roles. And, you know, we're all doing our best to interpret state regulations to the best of our ability. And in this case, we disagree. So we're taking the next step to try to figure it out. Um, so thank you, Rolf. Um, I believe uh, Maria and then Edwin, and we're really gonna try to keep this for two minutes, um, please, Maria. I think so. um, just as, as another um, person in, in the consulting industry, I was very interested to listen to what was happening um, just as a learning experience. And I have not been following this um, at other meetings. So I apologize if this has been answered before, but in the earlier discussion of the various avenues that have been looked into, talking to the town attorney, um, talking with USGS, um, I didn't see any mention or rather hear any mention of talking to DEP about how to interpret the Wetlands Protection Act and, and we do have circuit riders that are extremely helpful. So I was just curious, you know, what, what had already been provided by DEP on the matter, um, just as a learning thing. Yeah, so they won't comment on it. Um, Aaron, do you wanna do any more detail on that? They won't comment yeah. because if they end up in a situation where it, the decision is appealed, they are gonna have to make a decision and they don't wanna get involved before that point because it would be a conflict of interest. Exactly, yeah, we did receive some initial very general guidance, but on this specific situation, they would not comment. Yeah, that, that has been my experience that they won't comment on specific situations, but if they were asked, you know, 
how do you go through this and is it appropriate to do this or that? Um, they usually will say something. Um, so I, I was just curious, thank you. Yep. Thank you. All right, last person, Edwin, should be able to talk. Hi, my name is Edwin Gensler. I'm also, I live on Fearing Street across the street from uh, the, the several of the lots in question. And I wanna thank uh, the commission for uh, all the work that they're doing on this site visits. Aaron, your work with finding a fact was uh, remarkable. Uh, I too have lived in this neighborhood and have walked the property and um, it, it's very clear that the Wildwood Pond and um, the hills that UMass uh, drain into this home brook. Um, I just have a couple of short notes here, uh, really. Uh, some of it has to do with procedures and uh, voices. And I sort of feel like the neighborhood of Butters uh, have, have um, well, we're not visible. We don't know who was there. Maybe the commission can see how many are there. Certainly um, Jen can see, uh, but that's been a problem of communication on our side uh, that Mickey is there and present and uh can even i'm not even sure what he said there he wants to close the hearing is he allowed to even make that motion or is that a motion what what i'm not sure what he's so somebody could clarify that for me and then what the repercussions of a closed hearing mean um we're also not getting many of these documents i realize you're not getting them until the day of but we're not getting them at all so we can't look at Mickey's revisions, we can't look at uh, uh, some of the new data that's being consulted, or at least it comes out after the meeting, after the discussion. So if any of these things, and then lastly, um, Aaron mentioned that there were two groups from UMass doing a study or consulting. Uh, would it be possible to share that with the uh, butters uh, as well? So I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Edwin. I think um, Aaron has a comment or a response. I can also take a crack at it, Aaron. Do you want to explain what closing he this hearing means again in this context? And then also, can you let Edwin and other um, participants know where they can find all this documentation? Yes, so closing the hearing means that we're done taking public comment, pu taking comments from the applicant, taking comments from abutters. What it means is that basically the hearing is closed and then all that's left to do is actually issue the order. And issuance of the order would basically be the decision of the commission, um, just the commission members and the commission members alone. And um, staff would make recommendations and then they would issue based on that. Um, Again, at this point, because of where we are, it, um, I, sorry, it's late. <laughs> um, I, I'll just stop there, but it, the, the permit would be issued at the next meeting and it would, it would basically be the commission's decision on the, on the delineation. Um, as far as the- That we're, we would not be accepting the delineation because it's missing resource areas in our view. Correct, correct. And then documents are on the town website. Um, if you go to the Conservation Commission page and current applications, and we, I upload them almost instantaneously when I received them. I didn't, wasn't able to upload Mickey's um, items from this afternoon because I was doing site visits before the end of the day. But, um, but yes. Yeah. And I can send you a link to those as well. Um, Edwin, I think I have your email address. Or Edwin, if you can just email Erin tonight or in the morning, she can follow up with a link to exactly where all these documents are. Um, they're all publicly available. Um, all right, I think, so we've now spent a, over 45 minutes on this hearing. I think, unfortunately, we're going to have to move on. Um, I appreciate everyone tuning in repeatedly for this hearing. Um, and basically we will be continuing it until the next meeting 
Sorry, go ahead, Erin. Because well, are we continuing it? Because no, we're Mickey asked to it close and then the we're hearing. continuing the order at the next meeting. Okay. Right. I mean, if that's what Mickey wants us to do. I, I think at this point, um, you know, the commission's made the decisions, look at the plans, uh, evaluate uh, the changes that were made. We added additional wetlands uh, based on Emily's comments. So uh, I, I think it would be reasonable at this point to cite uh, uh, wetlands that you agree with uh, if you, you know, choose to call the stream uh, perennial, then there are bank flags and there'd be a 200 foot buffer from that. So I just want to be clear. Are you, you're asking us to close the public hearing? Just, yeah, I want yeah. to make sure. Okay. Just okay. okay. So we just need a motion to close the public hearing for 52 Fairing Street. I move we close the public hearing for 52 Fairing Street. Second. Okay. Got Leroy on that one. All right. Voice vote. Anna. Hi. Fletcher. Hi. Michelle. Hi. Leroy. Hi. Laura. Hi. Larry. Larry. Larry, you're muted. I forgot to unmute. Hi. All right. There we go. I and I'm an I'm loud an for me. <laughs> I'm an I. Okay. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Mickey. Um, so where are we? What are we? So well, our next hearing, our next hearing, we're moving on to our next hearing. That's okay. all we have to do. <laughs> 246 oh, Montague. Awesome. <laughs> and right, 246 wait, wait, sorry, can I jump in really quickly uh one of the people had asked how many folks were in attendance and it's just there were there are 28 uh attendees for that sec that component and like 78 prior to that just I don't know if people were interested but that was asked and I wanted to just note that. that's a good point I forgot to address that I don't know why it I mean this is just the platform that we're dealing with I don't know that there's anything purposeful about not allowing participants to see other no I'll other send they just tell the number when yeah that comes up so. I'll, I'll send yeah. Edwin a link to our to our meetings as well because it's in our, it's in the meeting record the attendees um and all they have to do is click on the YouTube video that's uploaded but um I think there's been some difficulty locating that so I'll send him a link to it so that he okay can. Thank you. If they're if they're if they're on Zoom, can't they just look at the bottom and see the participants? I don't think no. they can. Well, yeah, just us. Just us. They're not panelists. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Onward. <laughs> um, okay. Last one. Um, this is also a continuation. This is an ANRAD SWCA for Barry Roberts and Stanley Mitchell Life Estate for Confirmation of Resource Area Boundaries at two forty six Montague Road. Um, I'm realizing now that this is who Mickey is Mickey is also representing 246. Um, no. I would I would ask that the board um, request the applicant to do a continuation on this to the next meeting because we only got um, materials at 430 this afternoon and I have not even opened the email yet and it's not really fair for us to um, yeah comment on something that came in so late. Sorry, Mickey, I like moved you to panelist and then back, back. apologies, I am getting tired. Um, so welcome back. Uh, I, I don't disagree with what Erin said. If okay. I could just have two minutes just to show you what I submitted, we can continue it. Sure, great. Okay, uh, may I share my screen, Jen? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Um, so um, if you can see this plan, there's actually two sheets. And this is a, a complicated site in that there's a lot of farmed wetlands and floodplain. Uh, and Emily, yeah, I, I think the biggest thing is Emily suggested that uh, we include the entire 100-year floodplain as BVW. Um, and, and honestly, I can't dispute that because it would just take a long time to figure out the hydrology and let the farm fields grow for 
one or more years. It, it, I, I don't know what the development plans are. I haven't seen any plans for this property, but they're not going to work in the floodplain anyway. So the yellow line and the stippled yellow dots show the additional wetlands that were added. So we basically uh, are agreeing with Emily. We'll just call the the 100 year floodplain BVW. I added a note on farmed wetlands um, only because there are three fields in the floodplain that are currently in agriculture. They're either in hay or butternut squash or other production. And the farming characteristics of the site are very important to the neighbors. Um, the Mitchells want to continue to farm the site. Um, they want to see uh, agricultural use. So with, with whatever development goes <laughs> on there, the agricultural piece will continue whether or not it's in wetlands. And I just wanted to make that clear that um, those are existing site conditions. Um, the, um, see the other plan, uh, we, uh, this very upper right-hand corner, we added uh, an additional wetland that Emily pointed out it was mostly off-site, but it creeped onto the site. Uh, we extended the wetlands a little bit here, and you can see this lower area, the ski line extended, a couple of little flag changes. Uh, and then on the southern part of the site, there's uh, Eastman Brook is, uh, was within 200 feet of the property boundary. So we added the riverfront, this uh, southern part of the site. So we made a couple of changes um, to reflect those comments. And I, I don't expect you to make any decisions on this tonight, um, but they do want to uh, maintain the fields. Uh, I was out there two days ago. They didn't mow, they didn't plow, they left the flags in place. So if you do want to look at it, um, the Mitchells would appreciate if you, you looked at it sooner rather than later. So just to comment on that, we have a peer reviewer who, who looked at the site and wants to go out because there was a bunch of reflagging that was supposed to be done after her site visit and she wanted to go out and confirm the boundaries and there's there's money in the budget for her to go out and confirm those boundaries. So my recommendation would be that we line that site visit up with Emily immediately so she can get out there and have a look at that flagging and get us a report back on it so that we um, can move forward and that the mowing doesn't happen before that, because that would really be a problem. Yeah, and this plan was sent uh, to Emily as well. Okay, great. So sounds like we're, we need to get out, we need Emily to get out there for a site visit and maybe we could be included in that even if necessary, um, but we need to get Emily's final report before we can move forward. Um, and reviewing this application. So thank you, Mickey, for that overview. Thank you, Aaron, for tracking this and keeping us all moving. Um, I think we're looking for a motion to continue. And I can read the <clears throat> motion if you guys want. It's uh, we need a motion to continue the public hearing for 246 Montague Road to November 10th, 2021 at 7.45 p.m. I'll make that motion to uh, continue. Sorry, 246 Montague Road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 246 Montague Road. You said November 10th. Yep, at 745 p.m. 745. Second. All right. I got a second from Anna. All right. Voice vote. Fletcher. Oh, aye. Roy. Aye. Anna. Aye. Shell. Aye. Larry. Aye. Uh, Laura, did I do Leroy? Yes, I did. Sorry, and I'm an I. All right, Mickey, thank you for your endurance. Thank you for your time. Good night, everybody. Good night. All right. So, so we have we, a land use application, right, Aaron? We do. We do. Um, it is for stargazing on Mount Pollux, and these are previously these events were previously approved by Dave. Um, there was a couple dates that came in before this meeting even, um, and I have no issues or objections to it um, to the stargazing proposal. Um, trying to get kicked out of my <laughs> my, first, my uh, 
I got kicked out of my, uh, um, I was promoted into the town. Um, oh. So I'm getting back in there. So bear with me just a moment. Oh. Um, yes. So it is for um, Stetson School. Um, Kathy Buckley is the applicants. Um, they're proposing multiple events. Um, several of them have already passed uh, October 21st to the 29th, November 3rd, November 11th, no, uh, December 21st, and 11-17 um, was an additional date that they added in after. Um, 12 participants, two to three cars, um, start time is 5 p.m., end time is 10 p.m. I would recommend that we include the same um, uh, the same, um, I'm so sorry, <laughs> the, the same conditions as the last stargazing permit. I'm sorry. It's so late. Yeah. I just saw Kathy. I think you had your hand raised. Um, and this is your application. So, oh, has she, wait? no, is it, is, is that, I think. has she been waiting through this entire project for this? No, no, it's. I'm not that. It's a different Kathy. Oh, okay. Uh, Kathy oh, it's Jane. a different Kathy. Okay, hold on, hold on, everybody. Yeah, they they take students uh, students up there um, and look with binoculars and telescopes. One or two chairs is the only equipment that they use. But we had we previously approved stargazing up there um, with conditions, and I would just say we apply the same conditions for the stargazing permit that the previous permit had. Okay. I do think Kathleen is, is Kathleen Buckley is here with her hand raised though. Okay. Kathleen, sorry for the confusion. Oh. Do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I mean, I just, we, we just bring kids. Um, we would actually keep it to, to, um, one adult for every two kids that we bring, some telescopes, some binoculars, a couple of chairs, and we're absolutely obsessive about sweeping to make sure we don't leave even a scrap of trash. Great, thank you. Yeah, so I think we are just looking for a motion to approve this land use application with our boilerplate kind of guidance and conditions. I will move to approve the land use application for Mount Pollock's. Is there a date? Oh, all the dates. There's multiple uh, dates. Uh, all of the dates. Boilerplate conditions and the conditions we previously used for stargazing. Second. All right. Voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Anna. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Larry. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you, Kathleen, for sitting through all that. Thank I'm so you. sorry. I'm sorry, we couldn't that's get right. you in in the beginning of the meeting. Oh, uh, that's okay. I, I typed the whole time, so I got a lot of paperwork done. Oh, good. <laughs> Somebody got something done. <laughs> Thank you. Have a good night. Good Thank luck you. out there. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. That's our agenda. <laughs> right? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> that is it. I am for a move book. to adjourn. Yes, I think we need I to move. To oh, watch your. I second oh. that. Okay. I got beat. You got Colin. beat. Got All right. Beat. Voice vote. Fletcher. Aye. Leroy. Aye. Anna. Aye. Michelle. Aye. Larry. Aye. Laura. Aye. And I'm an aye. Good job, Jen and Aaron. Another Another good job, you guys. Killing it. God. Yeah, good job trying to keeping people in there. Are you uh, 